Okay, it must be ready now. Okay. Okay, it seems like we're live now. Okay. I guess let's give it a few more seconds. Okay. Uh, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think uh, this is our first Safari seminar series for summer 2021. Uh, this is an initiative we started just today. And the goal is to feature interesting talks uh, in computer architecture, in the cutting edge of computer architecture and computing systems to everyone who is interested in attending. And today we have our first talk. We're going to uh, discuss uh, the first uh, a, a rigorous characterization, analysis, and benchmarking of uh, the first commercial processing in memory architecture, the OpMem PIM architecture. And Juan is going to lead us through that through a talk and questions and answers, of course. Uh, and probably a lot of people know Juan, but Juan is a senior researcher and lecturer in Safari at ETH Zurich. Uh, he has been with us for almost four years and more. He's been teaching classes, doing research. And for the past year or longer, he's been working on the OpMem architecture and understanding different aspects uh, of the architecture. And he's going to present some of his latest results uh, as well as takeaways and analysis of the architecture. And hopefully this will lead to... Uh, more research and understanding of real processing in memory systems, and hopefully the development of uh, future data-centric computing architectures. I should also mention that uh, the paper is online, you can find it. And uh, we have also released uh, the source code of the workloads that Juan is going to introduce uh, on GitHub. And you can find the links on Juan's first slide. So Juan, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Honor, for the introduction. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending this talk. Um, I'm going to present our work, Understanding a Modern Processing in Memory Architecture, Benchmarking, and Experimental Characterization. Before I start, I would really like to thank you, uh, my co-authors, Isad, Ivan, Cristina, Geraldo, and Honor, for their contributions uh, to this work. And I would also uh, like to tell everyone that this uh, is going to be a comprehensive presentation where we are going to cover uh, multiple aspects uh, of our work and, and yeah, a majority of the contents of uh, our paper. Um, so I would like to start with a, a brief executive summary to motivate the work and explain, give an overview of what we have done in our work. Um, in current computing systems, data movement between memory and storage unit and the compute units is a major contributor to execution time and energy consumption. And one promising way to alleviate this data movement bottleneck is uh, processing in memory or PIM, which is a paradigm that has been explored for decades, more than 50 years, but technology challenges have prevented the successful materialization in commercial products. UPMEM is a French startup, which is the first to design, fabricate, and now commercialize the first publicly available and commercially available real-world processing in memory architecture. The uh, UPMEM PIM architecture essentially consists of DDR4 chips that contain uh, small processors called DRAM processing units or DPUs. Our work is an introduction to this uh, UPMEM PIM architecture and programming model a characterization of the DPU architecture and a benchmarking and workload suitability analysis. Our main contributions are a comprehensive characterization of an, an analysis of the first commercially available PIM architecture and a new benchmark suite, PRIM, which is the first benchmark suite for a real world processing in memory architecture. PRIM contains 16 workloads that are memory bound in conventional processor centric systems and we characterize these benchmarks by using a strong and weak scaling experiments and compare them to a state-of-the-art CPU and GPU counterparts. Main takeaways of our work are workload characteristics for processing in memory suitability, programming recommendations, suggestions and hints for our, uh, uh, designers of hardware and architecture of future PIN systems, and the print benchmark suite, which can be used as programming samples 
and for evaluation and comparison of current and future PIM systems, among other purposes. So data movement in current computing systems dominates performance and is a major uh, contributor to uh, energy consumption. Recent studies have shown that data movement accounts for uh, around 62% of total system energy in consumer applications, 40% in scientific applications, and 35% in mobile applications. And this makes sense because if you take a look at one uh, current system on chip, you will see that it contains CPU, GPU, cache hierarchy, accelerators, and among all these components and DRAM, there is a lot of data movement that is causing this um, huge bottleneck. So we believe that one way of alleviating this data movement bottleneck is uh, turning compute systems into something more data centric and processing in memory is a way of doing this. Processing in memory proposes computing where it makes sense or where the data resides. It's not a new paradigm. It's something that has been explored for more than 50 years. And this is the oldest paper that I am aware of from 1969 by William Kautz or this other one uh, from 1970 by Harold Stone. But in recent years, uh, processing in memory has uh, revived, let's say in the last decade because of the emergence of new memory technologies like, for example, uh, 3D stack DRAM and non-volatile memories. So if you want to read a comprehensive review of recent uh, processing in memory works, and also a discussion about uh, what, what are still open problems to enable the adoption of processing in memory, I would recommend you uh, this book chapter from us. And as I said in the beginning, uh, the first real world commercially available processing in memory architecture has been developed and fabricated by UPMEM. This architecture essentially consists of uh, so-called PIM enabled beams that uh, contain uh, DDR chips, but inside these chips, we don't all, not only have uh, memory arrays, but also have small processors called DRAM processing units. Um, here, you can take a closer look at the UPMEM DIM. This is uh, one version containing uh, eight chips per DIM. Every eight chips uh, are called a rank. And inside uh, these chips, we have DPUs running at 267 megahertz. A newer version um, um, is uh, uh, DIMs with 16 chips, so two ranks, and the DPUs running on them run at a frequency of up to 350 megahertz. We have experimented with both type of DIMs uh, in our work. And this architecture promises uh, massive benefits in terms of uh, energy savings, performance improvements, and TCO, total cost of ownership gains. Uh, but enabling uh, all these promises uh, wasn't easy for sure, uh, because the DRAM process where the um, UPMEM beam architecture is uh, fabricated uh, is highly constrained um, because Transistors are slower than in digital process. Uh, logic is uh, much less dense and, and also uh, routing density uh, decreases dramatically. So for example, it's only possible to have three metals, metal layers compared to uh, more than 10 in uh, ASIC process. But uh, still, uh, UPMAN made it and, um, and they manage, as we can uh, see, in the, we can read in the abstract of their patent, uh, to create, to design and fabricate a memory circuit containing a memory array. And here it's called first processor, which is one of these, uh, is this uh, a small processor that is next to the memory array and that we call DRAM processing unit or DPU. But there is also a control interface for the first processor to interact with a central processor that is a CPU that we will uh, typically called host CPU over the course of this presentation. And both the first processor and the central processor can access uh, the memory banks inside the uh, UPMEM beams, but they, they will have to do it um, in an uh, alternate manner as, as we will discuss. All the details of this uh, presentation and uh, all our, our study of the UPMEM PIM architectures, you can find them uh, in our paper, which is uh, publicly available online. And also uh, all our codes, micro benchmarks, benchmarks and scripts uh, 
are available in our repository. So let's start the presentation uh, with a quick look at the outline. So uh, we are going to start with an overview of the UPMEM based PIN system. Then we are going to introduce some basic concepts, important concepts of UPMEM PIN programming, and we will talk about the interaction and communication between the CPU and the DRAM processing units. Um, next, we are going to present the architecture of the DRAM processing unit and we analyze its performance, the arithmetic throughput and the bandwidth to the two main memory spaces that the DPU can access. Next, we are going to present our benchmarks, print benchmarks, and we are going to explain why we selected them. And next, we will evaluate the print benchmarks uh, through a strong and weak scaling experiments. And we will compare the performance of uh, two UPMEM based PIN systems to the performance of uh, uh, a state of the art CPU and GPU. Finally, um, we will give some key takeaways to uh, conclude this presentation. Over the course of this presentation and also uh, the paper, you will find. Uh, some color boxes containing general programming recommendations, programming recommendations that are derived from our work, uh, key observations and key takeaways. Uh, the color and the numbering of these boxes is the same uh, in the paper and uh, in the presentation to facilitate the connection between both. So let's start with the overview of uh, the UPMEM based PIN system. Um, the UPMEM based PIM systems follows uh, the, what we call the accelerator model. Um, the UPMEM DIMMs coexist uh, in the system with conventional DIMMs. And uh, this accelerator model essentially consists of uh, the, the UPMEM DIMMs uh, behaving as a coprocessor or a loosely coupled accelerator. What this means is that we need to explicitly move data between the main processor or the main memory of the processor, the host CPU, and the memory of the accelerator, which in this case are the uh, UPMEM DIMMs. And also we need to explicitly launch the kernel execution. So the code that is going to run on the UPMEM processors or DPUs. This model resembles GPU computing. And actually you can take a look at this uh, slide from one of our GPU lectures where you will see that the typical um, uh, scheme in, in GPU computing is that we need to move the input data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. Then we perform the computation using the GPU cores. And finally, we return the results uh, with a GPU to CPU transfer. So this is uh, very similar to what, uh, what happens in, in the UPMEM based PIM system. So first of all, uh, the host CPU or uh, loads the data, the input data to be processed um, into the uh, DRAM memory bank, this DRAM memory bank in the UPMEM DIMMs. Then the host CPU trans transmits a command to the DPUs for the DPUs to start, to start the execution. And then they uh, start processing this data. And in the meantime, uh, the CPU can wait for the data processing to complete. At that point, the memory banks in the UPMEM DIMMs become accessible to the host CPU and the host CPU can retrieve the results um, and, and yeah, copying them from the um, UPMEM memory to the uh, conventional main memory. So um, if we take a look at the system organization, here we see the host CPU. These are the pin chips and uh, inside them, we have memory arrays and processors. And, and here we have uh, another picture where we also not only see the UPMEM DIMMs that constitute the PIM enabled memory, but also some DDR uh, DIMMs or DRAM DIMMs that uh, represent the main memory. And both uh, DRAM DIMMs and UPMEM DIMMs are connected uh, to the memory controllers of the host CPU. We can take a closer look at the UPMEM DIMMs inside uh, or on each UPMEM DIMM we have eight or 16 chips and this is one or two ranks of uh, eight chips each. Um, if we take a look at the internals of one of these uh, pin chips, we will find 
eight uh, DRAM banks of size 64 megabytes. We call these DRAM banks NRAM, NRAM banks, and attached to each of these NRAM banks, we have uh, eight uh, DPUs, or we have one DPU attached to each of the um, uh, MRAM banks. So uh, by taking a very uh, quick look at what we have here, we have a DMA engine to access the MRAM bank. We have two SRAM based memories, one for instructions and one for operands. And then we have the DPU pipeline here. We will uh, talk more in detail very soon. So in, in more work, we have used um, one uh, UPMM, -based system, uh, UPMM based PIM system containing 20 UPMN DIMMs of 16 chips. So this is in total 40 ranks. Um, these uh, UPMN DIMMs uh, together with some D, uh, DRAM DIMMs for main memory are connected to a dual socket CPU. Uh, and in total, this system features 2,560 DPUs and 160 gigabytes of PIM enabled memory. Here you can take a a uh, closer look at the system in this picture where we can identify the uh, two CPUs, CPU0 and CPU1, some DIMMs that correspond to DRAM and the UPMN DIMMs. And uh, in our work, we have also used another smaller system with 640 DPUs. In this case, it's a single socket uh, CPU. And in total, this system has uh, 640 DPUs and 40 gigabytes of PIM enabled memory. Okay, very briefly, uh, some questions. Is it possible to share the DPUs and are there any security implications? Well, uh, to simplify things, DPUs cannot be shared across multiple CPU processes. Uh, the good thing is that uh, we will normally have so many DPUs in the system that there is no need for sharing. So we can partition the, 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 the available DPUs across the different processes and each uh, process will have access to a number of uh, DPUs uh, exclusively. Um, this assumption makes things simpler. For example, there is no need for an OS and also simplifies um, security implications. For example, there are no side channels because we don't have two processes running at the same time on the same DPU. Okay, after this overview or introduction to the UPMM based PIN system, Let's talk uh, about some UPMM PIM programming concepts and about the interaction between the CPU and the DPUs. So um, our first programming example is vector addition, one of our of the benchmarks in our benchmark suite. As uh, you all may know in vector addition, what we essentially do is performing the element-wise addition of two vectors, A and B, and storing the results in an output vector C. Um, when parallelizing this vector addition on a UPMM based PIN system, the first thing that we do is partitioning the input arrays and also the output array uh, across DPUs. We uh, divide the uh, arrays into equal, equally sized chunks and we assign each of them to the different DPUs available in the system. And then inside each of the DPUs, we are going to use the tasklets or software threads that run on the DPU to uh, process parts of the chunk that has been assigned to each of the DPUs. And it's the same in all DPUs. We will talk soon uh, in more detail about uh, the tasklets. Uh, but first, uh, just let me give you some, for a start, some general programming recommendations that is important and useful to follow when uh, we start programming uh, a UPMM based PIN system. Uh, these recommendations uh, come from different uh, sources of UPMN documentation. And the first of them is to execute on the DPUs portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. Um, we will see that this makes sense for two reasons. The first reason is because uh, if the portion of parallel code is, is uh, longer, we will uh, benefit more from the um, compute power of the DPUs. Um, and also because, as we will see soon, uh, there is an overhead of uh, communication between the CPU and the DPUs. So the longer uh, these, uh, the longest these um, um, portions of parallel code running on the DPUs, the better for the overall performance. Second recommendation is to split the workload into independent data blocks, um, which the DPUs operate on independently. Um, we will see what's the main reason for that, but you can 
uh, imagine if uh, one DPU needs to access data that resides in the memory of another DPU, this will uh, unavoidably entail an important overhead. So it's important to split the workload if it's possible um, into independent data blocks. The next programming recommendation is to use as many DPUs um, in the system as possible. Uh, this makes sense to uh, exploit as much parallelism uh, as possible that our, our, our workload has. And finally, launch at least 11 tasklets. And we will see soon the reason for this uh, programming recommendation. So when uh, we start writing a program um, um, that it's going to use the DPUs, the first thing that we need to do is allocating the DPUs. And this creates a DPU set, which is the uh, set of DPUs that we are going to use in our program. And to do that, we need to use this uh, DPU alloc API, where we specify the number of DPUs that we need. And here uh, it will return an identifier of the DPU set. One question here is, is it possible to allocate different DPU sets over the course of a program? And yes, the, the answer is yes. And we are going to see an example in the next slide. Um, if we need to allocate uh, different DPU sets over the course of a program, we will probably have to deallocate these DPU sets as well. And this is something that we can do with the DPU free API. But let's uh, take a look at the example. Uh, this example is uh, Nidelman Bunch, another of our uh, benchmarks. And uh, in Nidelman Bunch, what we essentially do is um, processing um, a 2D score matrix diagonal by diagonal. And because the size of the diagonals uh, uh, changes over time, it makes sense to use as many DPUs for each diagonal as we need, right? And that's uh, what we do in our code. Um, we first free the previous DPU set that process the, the previous um, diagonal, and then we allocate a number of uh, DPUs, which is uh, related to the length of the diagonal that we are going to process um, in the next iteration. So after having allocated a DPU set, having reserved a number of DPUs for uh, the usage of our program, we need to load the DPU binary and, that, uh, and we use the uh, DPU load API for that. Here you can see um, the uh, DPU set and the uh, DPU binary, which is previously compiled at, uh, um, at some um, um, path in, in our system. Is it possible to launch different kernels onto different GPU, uh, DPUs? Yes, it's possible. And this enables uh, workloads with task level parallelism. So we could, for example, um, allocate two different DPU sets and uh, inside the same program and uh, load different codes on the different DPU sets and have them um, uh, exploiting the task level parallelism, executing different tasks concurrently. Another possibility is to um, use different programs and allow these uh, different programs to use different DPU sets, right? We could, we could have two programs or processes, each of them allocating its own DPU set and um, uh, operating on them. So the next, next thing to uh, present and to discuss here is before starting the actual computation on the um, PIM enabled memory, we need to move data from the input data from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory. And uh, we call these CPU to DPU transfers. And after the termination of the DPU kernel, we will have to transfer results from the PIM enabled memory to the main memory. And we do this using DPU to CPU transfers. Um, the UPMM SDK provides three types of uh, these transfers. First, it provides serial CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers. In these serial transfers, we are targeting a single DPU or a single MRAM bank. Uh, so what this means is that if we uh, launch several of these um, serial transfers, one after the other two different NRM banks, the execution of these transfers will be serially. So one transfer will start when the previous transfer uh, will finish. It's also possible to use parallel CPU, DPU, or DPU, CPU transfers uh, when uh, we have multiple buffers or multiple parts of the same buffer that are going to be transferred at the same time uh, 
um, onto multiple DPUs or multiple MRAM banks because they are parallel, as you will see, um, um, they will um, achieve um, uh, higher bandwidth, overall bandwidth than the serial transfers. And then finally, we have broadcast CPU, DPU transfers where uh, we transfer a single buffer to multiple DPUs at the same time. We are going to take a quick look at the uh, three types of transfers before um, we study the bandwidth that can be achieved by each of them. For serial transfers, we have two, DP, uh, two APIs, DPU copy to, to copy to the DPUs, DPU copy from, to copy from the DPUs, from the on-run banks. And this is the um, uh, syntax of these uh, two APIs. Um, so what we need to define is the address um, in MRAM that where where uh, that we are targeting, uh, for example, in this in this case, to copy to, uh, and uh, we typically use this um, word that identifies the start of the MRAM range that can be freely accessed by applications. We don't need to allocate uh, MRAM explicitly, by the way. Um, next, uh, we have the offset with, within uh, MRAM. So these uh, two transfers that you can see on the screen are for the two input arrays or vector, vector addition, buffer A and buffer B. Um, so these are the pointers uh, to main memory. And, uh, and these are the exact locations where they are going to um, start uh, being copied. And this is the transfer size. And now we can talk about the parallel transfers. So in parallel transfers, there is one important limitation that we have to take into account is the fact that all buffers that are copied to multiple uh, DPUs at the same time need to be of the same size, at least in the current um, SDK, this is an existing limitation. So when uh, it comes to um, launching parallel transfers, we first need to prepare the transfers and then we push them, we, which means that we execute them. Um, and we define in this push operation, we define what's the direction of the transfer, either to the DPUs or from the DPUs. And here you can see the um, syntax. When we prepare uh, the transfers, we need to indicate what's the pointer to the main memory for the different DPUs, which in this case are identified by this uh, index I. Uh, we need to define the direction when we use the push API, uh, the offset within NRAM as uh, we also did in the serial transfers and the transfer size. And finally, the broadcast, broadcast transfer. So we have this API DPU broadcast to, uh, in this case, we are going to use a single buffer and we are going to transfer it to the whole DPU set, to all DPUs or MRAM banks in, in, the, in this DPU set. This is the syntax and here we define the pointer to main memory and the transfer size. Um, one question here is, is it possible to have different types or necessary to have different types of uh, transfers in a program? Uh, yes, it is, uh, even though in principle we will uh, probably try to use broadcast transfers and parallel transfers because as you will see soon, uh, they provide a higher bandwidth, but in some cases we really need to use um, serial transfers. And I have one example here is select one of our benchmarks. Um, in select, um, what we do is um, uh, checking one predicate and, um, and, and, and in this case, in, in our example, the predicate is true if the value is uh, even, so uh, what we do in this uh, select is removing even, even values and we only copy odd values to the output. So um, here, the first thing to do is partitioning the input array across DPUs. These are equally sized partitions. So this means that we can use parallel transfers, but then because the output will depend on the actual values that we have in each of these uh, chunks. So for example, DPU, zero here is going to discover two values to copy to the output, uh, DPU one, uh, another two, and DPU two, only one. So um, because the size of these chunks might, might differ uh, to the output array, we will use serial transfers. And understanding the performance of uh, the bandwidth that we can achieve with these parallel and serial transfers is also important because we are going to need to use them to, uh, for uh, inter-DPU communication. The reason is that there is no direct communication channel between DPUs. And uh, because of that, 
all inter-DPU communication takes place via the host CPU using CPU DPU and DPU CPU transfers. Or benchmark suite Prim includes uh, some uh, examples of these communication patterns, like for example, merging of partial results to obtain the final results. In this case, we only need DPU to CPU transfers. And an example of this is, for example, a histogram calculation, which is also one of our benchmarks. So in histogram calculation, what we do is we have an input image, we partition the image equally across, um, across uh, DPUs, we distribute the pieces, uh, to the different DPUs. And at the end of the kernel execution, each of the DPUs uh, will have produced one subhistogram. The CPU needs to gather all these subhistograms and reduce or merge them to obtain the final histogram. As you can see, in this case, we only need DPU to CPU transfers. But there might be more complex patterns. So for example, for redistribution of intermediate results or further computation. Um, an example is uh, breadth per search, BFS, another of our benchmarks. Uh, in BFS, um, we distribute the graph across uh, DPUs. And at the end of each iteration, uh, we have um, that uh, each of the DPUs has created a frontier, a partial frontier because we are using a top-down approach. So what the CPU needs to do is gathering these frontiers, reducing them, and um, after uh, obtaining um, 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 complete frontier, redistribute, redistribute it over uh, the available DPUs in the system for the next iteration of the BFS kernel. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the um, bandwidth results here. How Juan, fast... Juan, Juan yes. maybe uh, maybe this is a good time to take some questions. We have a batch of questions, uh, okay. and I, I will ask them to you in some uh, order, mm -hmm. and then we can continue, of course, uh, this. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so Antonio Pena asks, uh, so the main difference with other accelerators is that these are connected to a memory interface offering direct load store capabilities. Uh, yeah, exactly. So here we have the um, uh, UPMM DIMMs are uh, connected to the memory bus and uh, interface with the host CPU via the uh, memory controller. Mm -hmm. That's a key difference with respect to uh, GPU programming, for example, where typically uh, GPUs are uh, connect discrete GPUs are connected uh, through the PCI Express bus or MBLink or, or something else. Okay. Okay, that's good. Maybe they can follow up if they have questions. Uh, because the, uh, the, the reason they asked this question is the offloading mode of work looks so much like other accelerators they mentioned. And I think that was intentional to make it easier uh, to use upmem architecture. Is that correct? I think that at this point, that's the easiest way to enable the integration of the um, UPM and DIMMs into the, into the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I believe that there is uh, a lot of work to do here um, in order to enable more uh, seamless uh, access for the uh, host CPU to the to the MRAM banks. But I, I think that this uh, can be a uh, subject of future generations of this architecture. OK, that's great. So there is one question, relate, one other question related to this, a, pro a provocative question, let's say, by Hamid Farzane. It says, so it's just like the GPU, but slower and less compute capability available to you. So what's the advantage in using upmem? So uh, the advantage of using uh, upmem is that you don't need a GPU, which uh, for sure is, uh, uh, is costly and, uh, it, uh, and, and, and it consumes a lot of energy. Um, so, and also uh, another advantage of using this system is that as we will see, uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, it can be faster uh, for certain workloads than the uh, GPUs. Yeah, maybe I'll add to it. Basically, I don't uh, think there's any GPU that's so tightly integrated with DRAM today. So the processors are going to, the processors here are right next to DRAM banks. As a result, you have access to very high bandwidth and you minimize the data moment. So data moment uh, doesn't go off uh, the DRAM chip or even the DRAM bank area. Uh, so the data moment between the processor and memory is very low compared to a GPU today. And you have clearly a lot of parallelism uh, 
across the different DRAM chips. So higher bandwidth, low latency, and low energy, as long as you can partition your work nicely across the DPUs, which one we'll talk about, uh, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, so okay. there's one question from uh, Wenmei Hu. It's great to have Wenmei uh, here. Uh, he has a specific question about the vector addition example that you showed. Mm -hmm. For that example, maybe you can go, that, go to that slide. What are, yeah. the what are the alignment requirements between the memory allocations for A, B, and C? Uh, so yeah, that's actually a, a really good question. So uh, when uh, we allocate, when we move um, input data and when we allocate the, the output data as well uh, on the NRAM memory, this needs to be um, eight by the line. That's uh, one thing to uh, take into account when we are distributing the workload across different DPUs, especially yeah, if we are using uh, types data types uh, of less than eight bytes. I think that that's the, um, the let's say that the, the, the most important thing to take into account when we perform this allocation and, and this data movement between the main memory and the pin enabled memory. Okay. Okay, there's one more question uh, from Khalid Javed. Uh, how, the, how, how does the operating system handle these new memory architectures? Do the architectures require modification in the operating system? Um, I think that uh, it, 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 it requires uh, some modifications in the BIOS, uh, but I don't know uh, the details of that. Um, the, um, there is, as I said, uh, at some point, there is no uh, operating system running on the DPUs themselves, and they are uh, handled by the uh, runtime driver that runs on the on the CPU side. Mm -hmm. So it's really through library calls uh, mm -hmm. that, that that the program interacts with uh, the Opmam SDK, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe we can get back to that later on. If yeah, there there's no real need for operating system to run on the DPU, as far as I understand. And uh, currently, there's yeah. Okay. Uh, one last question, I think, for now, uh, from Hamid Farzana. The problem is we cannot have a unified memory between the application and the PIM-enabled memories. You have to copy the data on the DPUs and copy it back whenever they're ready. I guess it's more of a comment, but you can take it as a question. Yeah, exactly. That's a comment, uh, and actually, that's a very good comment. I think that that's a uh, subject uh, of future work, how to enable a, a unified virtual memory space. Uh, that uh, facilitates the interaction between the CPU and the and the DPUs, and maybe even at some point uh, saves and completely avoids these uh, data transfers that uh, we um, still need uh, to do in this, uh, uh, let's say, um, initial uh, processing in memory system. Okay. And 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 and. and, and when we reach to that point, for sure, the advantage with respect to DPU, GPUs will be uh, completely clear because we will avoid uh, any type of data transfer to uh, enable the um, uh, start of the execution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think my, uh, I, I agree with you. I think for adoption purposes, uh, the model is uh, more like a GPU or accelerator today. You have to move from some main memory to the memory of the, let's say, uh, in-memory accelerator currently, but uh, I think future, future data-centric systems may not need that uh, going into the future. You can just process the data uh, before moving the data uh, to a special memory because that special memory would be capable of processing and moving the data. So this may require also more support for in-memory data movement and reorganization, uh, which is a subject of research. Yeah, okay. I agree that uh, future PIM system uh, will benefit uh, from that. Yeah. Okay. I think this is all for now. We can continue, and I will try. Uh, I will try to gather questions and stop you at, at an appropriate time again. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Honor. Um, so yeah, um, we were going to talk about uh, how fast as the, are these data transfers, and to do that, we use micro benchmarks to measure the sustained bandwidth of all types of CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers. We ran two different experiments. In the first one, we use a single DPU. And, and we use a variable uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfer size. Uh, 
from eight bytes to 32 megabytes. In the second experiment, we uh, we will run uh, we will use a, an entire rank. Um, we will uh, have an we will transfer arrays of 32 megabytes and we'll change the number of uh, MRAM bands um, that we involve uh, in the experiment from one to 64, but all within the same rank. Um, in our paper and also in this presentation, we don't show any experiments with more than one rank because our preliminary experiments show that the current new PIM SDK only paralyzes transfers within the same rank. And, um, and one thing to mention uh, at PROM is that the maximum transfer bandwidth that we can achieve is limited by the DDR4 bandwidth uh, because uh, as you already know, uh, all these uh, UPM and DIMMs are connected through the memory bus to the CPU. And this uh, relates or connects us to the first of our general uh, programming recommendations, um, uh, try to maximize the use of the uh, DPUs and run uh, pieces of code as long as possible, because this way it, it will be easier to amortize the cost of these transfers. Okay, so let's take a look at our first experiment. Here we vary the DRAM transfer size between eight bytes and 32 megabytes. Um, here in the plot, you can see on the Y axis, the sustained CPU, DPU or CPU or DPU, CPU bandwidth uh, in log scale. And uh, in the X axis, we see the transfer size from eight bytes to 32 megabytes. These are the results for the CPU, DPU transfers. And these are the results for the DPU CPU transfer. So one thing that we observe is that in the very beginning, um, the bandwidth increases with the transfer size, and at some point it uh, tends to start saturating. So key observation number seven in our paper, which is the first key observation in this talk, larger CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers between the host main memory and the MRAM banks of the DPUs result in higher sustained bandwidth as we can see uh, in these experimental results. So for uh, one rank, um, here we evaluate uh, all types of transfers, serial parallel and broadcast CPU, DPU transfers and serial and parallel DPU, CPU transfers. And we vary the number of DPUs on MRAM banks between one and 64, which is what you can see here um, in the X axis. So these are the results for um, serial transfers, um, CPU, DPU, and, C and DPU, CPU. As you can see, the bandwidth remains flat because all these transfers to different um, DPUs are executed serially. And these are the results for the parallel transfers. Um, so first observation here is that the sustained bandwidth of the parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers increases with the number of uh, MRAM banks and DPUs that we are using inside the RAM, as you can see um, in the plot. Another observation is that the sustained bandwidth of the parallel CPU DPU transfers, uh, either parallel and also serial, as you can see uh, in the plot, um, is, uh, is higher than the bandwidth of DPU CPU transfers. And the reason is that uh, they are implemented in a different way in the in the runtime library. Uh, while the low transfers, uh, the, the the CPU DPU transfers uh, use um, AVX write instructions, which which are asynchronous. The DPU CPU transfers um, use uh, AVX read instructions, which are uh, synchronous. And also, uh, we can observe that the sustained bandwidth of uh, broadcast CPU DPU transfers is higher. Um, even than that of the uh, parallel CPU DPU transfers. And one reason for this um, is that uh, the broadcast, tra broadcast transfers as achieve higher temporal locality in the CPU cache hierarchy because we are transferring a single buffer to all DPUs, while in the parallel transfers, we use uh, multiple buffers, um, one different buffer for the different DPUs and MRAM banks. Another um, important observation here is that the maximum bandwidth that we managed to measure here is still lower than the uh, maximum bandwidth of DDR4, typically 19 gigabytes per second. And, um, and we believe that one reason for that um, is the use of a transposing or transposition library uh, 
by the uh, runtime library. And the reason is that um, as um, for sure you may know, in, 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 in a conventional uh, DRAM, what the, the way to store uh, data is in a horizontal manner. So for example, if we have to store um, 64 bit elements, uh, we will store eight bits in um, every uh, of these eight consecutive chips that we have here. But when we are using the beam enabled memory, what we want to have inside each MRAM bank is uh, complete words. Why is that? Because uh, they need to be completely accessed by the DPUs, by the processors uh, near memory. And to do that, what we do is transpose, what the uh, UPMM library does is transposing uh, the data in order to enable uh, the DPUs to see complete words of 64 bits. Okay, so uh, this is the analysis of the bandwidth between CPU and DPU, and you can find uh, all the, the codes that we have used in our repository. Now let's talk about uh, how to start the execution. So we have already uh, talked about how to communicate data between the CPU and the DPUs, but now need, we need to uh, launch the kernel, the, the, the code that is going to run uh, on the DPU. And to do that, we use this DPU launch API uh, on a DPU set. There are two ways of launching a, a kernel onto a DPU set. It might be synchronous or asynchronous. In the synchronous case, the um, CPU um, execution gets suspended until the kernel finishes. In the asynchronous mode, the control is returned to the host CPU and uh, at some point it will have to check for the kernel completion. This asynchronous execution can enable, for example, task level parallelism because we could uh, launch uh, one uh, DPU kernel asynchronous for, a, for a synchronous execution on a DPU set and then return the control to the CPU and then create another DPU set and launch another um, completely different task onto another set. And, uh, and another thing that this asynchronous execution can enable is the concurrent um, execution in CPU and DPU. So for example, we could distribute in some way the input data set uh, across the CPU and the available uh, DPUs in the system, and they could be uh, computing on, on different parts uh, of the data set. And uh, one last thing that we need to understand in order to be able to uh, start the execution on the on the um, DPUs is how to pass parameters to the kernel. In this case, uh, we are also going to use uh, CPU DPU transfers, and this can be serial or parallel. But the main difference here is that we are not going to copy to the MRAM banks. We are going to be able to copy to uh, the working RAM or WRAM, which is a, a scratchpad memory that the DPU uh, has. We are going to talk about the WRAM very soon. Um, and these uh, transfers can be used for input parameters and also for some uh, results, especially if they are uh, scalars. So um, in the uh, DPU code, we will need to declare the um, um, array where we are going to store, in this case, the uh, input opera and the, yeah, the input arguments. Um, we declare it as uh, host because it, it, uh, even though it's going to reside in this WRAM, it's accessible by the host. And then uh, we either use a serial transfer or a parallel transfer um, to that uh, memory space in WRAM. Okay, so we are done with the introduction to UPMM programming. Now let's start talking about the DRAM processing unit itself and uh, let's analyze its performance. So um, recall this figure where we have the um, main CPU, we have the, some chips and inside uh, each of the pin chips, we have uh, uh, a memory arrays and we also have the pipeline. Here we have uh, uh, another view um, with the host CPU, the PIM enabled memory and also the main memory and we can uh, take a closer look at the internals of these uh, pin chips. So inside the pin chip, what we'll, we will find is a DDR4 interface for the uh, CPU, host CPU to be able to access the MRAM banks. And we also have a control status interface for the host CPU to uh, transfer commands and communicate with the DPU pipeline. 
Um, here we can see one of the eight banks, eight DRAM banks of size 64 megabytes called NRAM banks um, that we, we can see, we, we have inside each of the PIM chips and one DMA engine to access this bank to read and write. And then two SRAM based memories. One is for instructions of size uh, 24 kilobytes. So it can hold up to 4,096 instructions. And uh, then we have uh, another larger memory space of size 64 kilobytes, uh, which is all uh, the uh, working RAM or WRAM. And it's a scratch pad where we are going to store uh, input and output operands. And finally, uh, here we have the DPU pipeline. Let's take a closer look at this DPU pipeline. It's an in-order pipeline. Um, in the current generation, it can run at a frequency of up to 350 megahertz, and it's a, a fine-grained multi-threaded architecture. Um, it, it, uh, it, uses, uh, it has up to 24 hardware threads, each with its own uh, architectural context, for example, its own program counter. And, um, and the way that the, um, this is going to work is that we have a scheduler that is going to um, issue instructions from different threads in a cyclic manner on this uh, pipeline. The pipeline has 14 stages. In the first stage, uh, we select uh, one thread uh, to dispatch onto the pipeline. We read the next instruction uh, in these fetch stages from the IRAM. Then we access operands in the register file, format them, and then uh, we um, arrive at the ALU stages where we either use the ALUs or um, access uh, to read input operands from WRAM or write um, output results into this uh, WRAM. And finally, we will uh, do some result formatting before uh, storing the, the results of the um, arithmetic operations into the register file. So one thing that we want to do is to measure, understand how fast this DPU pipeline can be. And, uh, and to do that, uh, we measure the maximum arithmetic throughput for different data types and operations. We create a micro benchmark where we stream over an array in the WRAM and we perform read, modify, write operations on the, on the elements of this array. Uh, we run experiments on a single DPU and we vary the number of tasklets of software threads uh, from one to 24 because 24 is the number of uh, hardware threads. Um, you are going to see results for uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and for four different data types, uh, integer of 32 and 64 bit, and floating point operands of single precision and double precision. Uh, we perform the measurements using an accurate cycle counter that the SDK provides. And in uh, all measurement, we include not only the arithmetic operation, um, that we are microbenchmarking, but also the uh, WRAM accesses, including address calculation. And the reason for that is, is because WRAM um, is uh, where input and output operands are stored. Let's take a, a quick look at one of our microbenchmarks. In this case, it's for uh, addition of 32-bit integers. Uh, at the top, you can see the C-based uh, code. Uh, at the bottom, you see the uh, compiled code for uh, the in the UPM and DPU ISA. So uh, here, first thing to do in the uh, C-base code is to allocate some uh, array, some space in in WRAM. This mem allo allocates uh, an array of uh, size, size, time, size of int uh, in WRAM, and then we uh, stream through this array with this for loop. Um, so these are this is so this um, for loop compiles to these instructions here for uh, initialization of the index, uh, index update, and conditional jump. Um, here you can see the access to WRAM to the buffer A in WRAM to read one element and uh, move it to a register. To do that, we need to first calculate the address uh, in, DRAM, in WRAM and then perform the load operation. Um, here we have the addition uh, operation. And finally, we stored the result um, back to WRAM. So let's take a look at the 
uh, result of these and other micro benchmarks. Uh, here uh, in, in the plots, you are going to see arithmetic throughput in mega operations per second. And uh, in the X axis, you, you see the number of tasklets. So these are the results for uh, addition and subtraction of 32-bit uh, operands, 32-bit integer operands. These are for multiplication and division, and these are for the other data types. So one first key observation here is that the arithmetic throughput of the DPU saturates at 11 or more tasklets. And this observation is consistent across data types and operations and connects to the uh, programming recommendation number four that we, uh, we presented in the beginning of the, of the talk. Another observation is that there is a throughput difference between uh, integer 32-bit operations and 64-bit operations. In this case, for addition and subtraction, uh, um, integer 32 is 17% faster. Um, can we explain why this happens? Uh, yes, we can do it. And we need to take into account that the peak throughput saturates uh, so it's achieved at uh, 11 tasklets, uh, and when the pipeline is full, one instruction retires every cycle. So in order to obtain the theoretical arithmetic throughput, we need to know what's the frequency of the DPUs, and we need to know the number of instructions that we need for each operation. And this is something that we can uh, figure out by inspecting the code. This is, uh, for example, a screenshot of the uh, Compiler Explorer, which is a pretty useful tool. Um, here on the left, you can see the, uh, the, the benchmarks in, in the high level language. Uh, this is for uh, 30 bits and for 62 bits, uh, 64 bits. And at the, uh, on the right side, we see the uh, compiled code. This is for um, the 32 bit benchmark and the 64 bit benchmarks. And we, we can see that the only difference between these two is this. Uh, at C instruction, which is needed because here we are operating on 64-bit elements, but the pipeline only has 32-bit uh, ALU. So um, uh, with this uh, at C, what we are doing is uh, an addition with carry operating on the um, upper 32-bits uh, of uh, the 64-bit uh, operands. So you can count six instructions in the 32-bit at sub micro benchmark, uh, seven instructions for 64 bits. And with these two numbers, we can obtain the theoretical uh, arithmetic throughput for uh, the 32-bit uh, addition and subtraction uh, is equal to 58.33 mega operations per second for 64-bit operands. Uh, seven instructions is 50 mega operations per second. And as uh, you can see, this is uh, very similar to what we are measuring in our experiments. OK, uh, one more observation is that there is a huge throughput difference between addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division, uh, also for uh, integer operands. And the reason for that is that the DPUs don't have a 32-bit multiplier. And the way that the um, SDK implements uh, multiplication and division is by using an instruction that performs bit shifting and addition in one cycle when the pipeline is full. And uh, so this means that uh, for 32-bit uh, operands, we need uh, up to 32 instructions of this uh, bit shifting and addition. Uh, for the implementation of multiplication and division. That's what explains the throughput difference. And another thing that we can observe is that there is also a very um, a large uh, throughput difference between integers and uh, floating point operands. It's essentially one order of magnitude. Uh, and the reason for that, for this difference, is that uh, the DPUs provide native hardware support for uh, integer addition and, and, and subtraction, which what leads to high throughput for these operations, but they don't natively support um, floating point operations, same as they don't natively support um, uh, integer multiplication and division as, as we have seen uh, in the previous slide. So the, all these operations are emulated by the UPMN runtime library, and this leads to lower throughput. Our code is available in the repository. So now, after having analyzed what's the um, performance that we can achieve uh, thanks to the pipeline, now we, we want to 
see what's the interaction between this pipeline and the uh, scratch pad, the WRAM, where we are storing uh, the operand. So to do that, we measure the uh, bandwidth of WRAM using the stream benchmark. As uh, you may know, the stream benchmark has four versions, copy, add, scale, and triad. And the operations that are performed, I mean, copy is simply copy. There are no operation in add, scale, and triad. We use respectively addition, multiplication, and addition and multiplication. Um, now we vary the number of tasklets from one to 16, and we show results for one DPU as well. We don't include accesses to NRAM, and the reason for that is that we want to focus on, on what's the uh, latency and bandwidth that um, uh, WRAM provides. Let's very uh, quickly uh, take a look at the stream benchmark for WRAM. We need to allocate um, our um, uh, arrays in WRAM, in this case, buffer A and buffer B. And what we do is uh, in, in each of the tasklets of the DPU, we um, execute this copy element by element from buffer A to buffer B. This is for addition. We are in this case using two input arrays and one output array and performing one addition, uh, scale and triad. And here you can see that we are reading eight bytes and uh, writing eight bytes to WRAM and we perform no arithmetic operations. In this case, we are reading 16 bytes and we write eight bytes and perform an addition. Here we read eight bytes and write eight bytes and perform one multiplication. And here is 16 bytes read, uh, eight bytes written and perform multi multiplication and addition. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, here in the plot, you will see the sustained WRAM bandwidth that we are measuring uh, versus the number of tasklets. These are the results for the copy stream benchmark, add, and scale, and triad. And, and here you can uh, see the uh, bandwidth values that uh, we are measuring. Um, can we justify these values in, in, a, in a theoretical manner? Can we estimate these values? Uh, yes, we can do it by assuming that the pipeline is full and that uh, there is a number bytes of bytes that we read from WRAM and write to WRAM. And um, if we know this number and we know the uh, frequency of the DPU and the number of instructions that we need to the um, uh, specific operation, in this case, the particular uh, stream benchmark, we can obtain the uh, theoretical WRAM bandwidth. And that's what we have done for uh, these examples. So for example, uh, for copy, we only need two instructions inside the uh, inner loop, one WRAM load and one WRAM store. Uh, so these two instructions, if the pipeline is full, we are using uh, 11 tasklets, we will need uh, 22 cycles to execute these two instructions. And by executing these two instructions, we are moving a total amount of uh, data, which is uh, 11 times uh, 16 bytes, uh, 176 bytes in total. So if we use the, this expression, we will calculate that the theoretical WRAM bandwidth is around 2,800 megabytes per second, which is more or less uh, what we are measuring. And um, for addition, we can do for the add benchmark, we can uh, do exactly the same. In this case, we need five instructions. We need uh, two loads because we have two input arrays, A and B, an addition, uh, an add C instruction, because um, as you can see, we are operating on 64-bit um, integers and an store operation to uh, store the result uh, back to NRAM, back to WRAM. So five instructions uh, with 11 tasklets. Uh, we need 55 cycles to read and write 11 times 24 bytes from or to WRAM. And this results in 1,680 megabytes per second, which is again, uh, more or less what we are measuring. And we can uh, do uh, similar calculations for scale and triad. Uh, one more thing with respect to the WRAM bandwidth is that uh, we observe that all eight byte uh, WRAM loads and store take one cycle when the pipeline is full. And what this means is that the bandwidth that we can achieve from the WRAM is independent of the memory access pattern, either streaming, strided, or random, because um, as I said, every w WRAM load and store 
takes only one cycle. But anyway, we um, double check that that's the case by uh, using a micro benchmark, a simple micro benchmark where we use three arrays. Um, a is an array that contains indices that are going to be accessed in arrays B and C. So what we do is uh, copying um, elements from uh, B to C according to the, um, uh, to the indices in the array A. Uh, for a streaming uh, case, we are uh, using unit strided um, uh, elements in, in, in A. Uh, for the strided access, we, uh, so there is a distance, at a certain stride between consecutive elements in array A, uh, this uh, array of indices, and in the random case, the, the values, uh, the indices contained in A are completely random. As I said, uh, these three versions of the benchmark take exactly the uh, same execution time. Okay, so uh, if both the stream benchmark and also the, this other uh, micro benchmark for WRAM access pattern are available in the repository. Now we are going to analyze what's the uh, access to, how about the access to NRAM, right? We are going to measure the latency and we are going to measure the bandwidth between the um, NRAM bank and the WRAM. So, um, Uh, so we are going to do this for different access patterns and uh, we create several micro benchmarks for these. First of all, we are going to measure the latency of a single DMA transfer. The um, UPMN SDK provides two uh, uh, instructions for transfers between MRAM and WRAM or between WRAM and MRAM. And these are MRAM read and MRAM write. Uh, we are also going to use the stream benchmark again and uh, we create two different uh, benchmarks, micro benchmarks for uh, the strided access pattern. We will explain them soon. And uh, we also create uh, one micro benchmark, the, the gaps benchmark to uh, characterize the random access patterns. In this case, uh, we obviously include the accesses to MGRAM in our measurements. Let's uh, start with the analysis of the latency of a single DMA transfer. So here, in these plots, uh, you can see uh, the x-axis is the data transfer size because we are going to uh, change between 8 and 2048 bytes the size of the transfer uh, between um, WRAM, between uh, MRAM and WRAM or vice versa. And here in the y-axis on the left, we have the bandwidth. On the right, we have the uh, latency in cycles. Um, that we, after, after measuring the latency, we can obtain the NRAM bandwidth with this uh, simple expression. The NRAM bandwidth in bytes per second is the size of the transfer multiplied by the frequency of the DPUs divided by the measured NRAM latency. So uh, one uh, first important observation here is that uh, we can model the NRAM latency with a linear expression, something like this. The NRAM latency in cycles is equal to alpha plus uh, beta time size, being alpha kind of a fi fixed cost of the transfer. And uh, this beta time size is a variable cost because um, it depends on size, which is the size of the um, NRAM WRA transfer. And as you can see uh, in the plot, this um, uh, model uh, maps, I mean, matches very well the or MRAM uh, latency measurements for both MRAM reads and for MRAM writes. Uh, according to our measurements, the value of beta is 0 0.5 cycles per byte. And this gives us a theoretical and maximum MRAM bandwidth of 700 megabytes per second at, at a frequency of 350 megahertz. And actually all measurements here are uh, pretty close to those uh, 700 megahertz, uh, megabytes per second. Okay, uh, so key observation number four is that the uh, access latency of the, to the MRAM uh, increases linearly with the transfer size. That's what uh, our model shows. And also uh, from more measurements, we have obtained that the maximum theoretical MRAM bandwidth is two bytes per cycle. Okay, 
Another uh, observation, read and write accesses to MRAM are uh, symmetric. And we also observe that the sustained MRAM bandwidth increases with the data transfer size. So one programming recommendation that uh, stems from this observation is that for uh, data movement between the MRAM bank and the WRAM, uh, it's uh, recommended to use large DMA transfers uh, when all the access data, all the data that we move between MRAM and WRAM is actually going to be used. Okay, so um, another observation is that the, as you can see in the plot, the MRAM latency changes slowly between eight and uh, 128 bytes. Um, so the reason for that is that for small transfers, the fixed cost dominates the variable cost. So in our experiments, uh, this uh, alpha, this fixed cost is something between um, 70 and 80 cycles. So uh, if we uh, compare to the variable cost to, for, uh, for example, very uh, small transfer of size eight bytes, because beta is 0 0.5, this variable cost is only four, which is much smaller than alpha, right? Only when uh, we are using uh, size equal 128, this variable cost is going to be around uh, 64 cycles, which is more or less in the order of magnitude of the, or of the 780 cycles of the fixed cost. So uh, one programming recommendation from this is that for small transfers between the NRAM bank and the WRAM, um, it's recommended to fetch more bytes than the necessary within a 128 byte limit. And the idea here is that we may only need to access uh, eight bytes or 16 bytes, but because the latency doesn't increase much uh, when, when we access something larger, like for example, 64 bytes or 128 bytes, we can read a larger chunk, place it in WRAM and have the code checking if the next value to access is already in WRAM before issuing a new uh, transfer from, from MRAM. Okay, another observation here is that the, um, so the bandwidth tends to saturate, right? So uh, for very large transfer, like for example, 2048 byte transfers, we see that there is almost no bandwidth increase with respect to 1024 byte transfers. It's only like four times, 4% 4 more bandwidth. Uh, but there is uh, a, a dark side of using larger uh, transfers. And it's the fact that if we are using a 2048 transfer between MRAM and WRAM, we need to allocate 2048 bytes in WRAM. And the whole WRAM is uh, shared by uh, all the tasklets that our program uh, is using. So uh, if we need to allocate uh, many of these 2048 byte buffers in WRAM, we may end up having to reduce the number of tasklets that uh, we can run on the DPU. So one programming recommendation here is to uh, check what are the, the actual uh, needs of WRAM and choose the uh, data transfer size between the NRAM bank and the WRAM based on the program's WRAM usage in order to uh, deal with this trade-off between the um, uh, amount of the bandwidth that we can achieve from MRAM and the number of tasklets that can run uh, on the DPU. Okay, so these are the results uh, uh, corresponding to a single DMA transfer. Now let's take a look at the results for the stream benchmark. So in, in principle, we are using the same code as we use for WRAM. Uh, the main difference now is that we include, so the, remember that this is the, the inner loop for, for the copy stream benchmark. Uh, the, the main difference now is that we are including uh, the MRAM read and MRAM uh, write transfers to load one block uh, of data from MRAM to WRAM and then write it back uh, to uh, MRAM, from WRAM to MRAM. Uh, we create one new version of the copy stream benchmark that we call copy DMA, because in this case, uh, uh, we don't uh, have the, this inner loop that goes over the uh, arrays in WRAM, but we just simply read one chunk of data uh, from MRAM, put it in WRAM and then move it back to another um, position in, 
uh, in the in MRAM. So uh, we actually going to start with this copy DMA uh, benchmarks, stream benchmarks. So here uh, you can see the sustained NRAM bandwidth on the Y axis and the number of task legs on the X axis. Uh, one observation is that the sustained bandwidth of the copy DMA is very close to the theoretical maximum that we uh, obtained before, 700 uh, megabytes per second. And this results in uh, uh, overall uh, sustained bandwidth of uh, around 1.6 terabytes per second on the whole uh, system with more than 2,000 DPUs that we have used in, in, in our experiments. It's, uh, pretty uh, high bandwidth, which is higher than um, even the latest uh, GPUs. Uh, one observation here is that the uh, bandwidth of copy DMA saturates with two tasklets, uh, even though the DMA engine that uh, performs these transfers can only sustain one transfer at a time. But the reason uh, to see this uh, slightly higher bandwidth for two or more tasklets is that uh, if we are using two more tasklets, it's guaranteed that there is always a DMA request in queue to keep the DMA engine busy all the time. And this explains that we achieve a little bit more bandwidth uh, uh, for more than two or more tasklets. For uh, copy at, uh, we see that the bandwidth uh, in, in this case saturates at four and six tasklets respectively. Uh, for a scale and triad, it saturates at 11 tasklets. So the reason to, uh, to for, for these saturation points relates to the, um, to the uh, relation between the latency, the overall latency of all NRAM accesses and the latency of execution uh, in the pipeline. So uh, one thing we observe is that for copy and add, the latency of the NRAM accesses that are executed one after the other um, um, overcomes, so, so becomes longer than the uh, pipeline latency for four and six, six tasklets respectively. And this explains the saturation point for these two benchmarks. Um, for a scale and triad, the pipeline latency is always longer than the MGRAM latency for any number of tasklets. And the reason is that uh, they both use this uh, costly uh, multiplication, and that's why they saturate at 11 tasklets. So key observation is that when the access latency to an MRAM bank of one of these uh, streaming benchmarks, like for example, copy DMA, copy or add, is larger than the pipeline latency, which is the uh, execution latency of uh, arithmetic operations and WRAM accesses, the performance of the DPU saturates at a number of tasklets smaller than 11. And that's what we call a memory bound workload. However, when the pipeline latency for one of these streaming benchmarks like the scale and triad is larger than the MRAM access latency, the performance of the DPU saturates at 11 tasklets. And we call this a compute bound workload. Um, we will soon go back again to these um, memory bound and compute bound regions of the DPU. But first we are going to uh, see what's the bandwidth that we can achieve for strided and random access patterns. So for strided uh, access patterns, as I said before, we are going to use two different uh, micro benchmarks. One is called coarse grain and the other one is uh, called fine grain, strided access. So the, the main difference between these is that in the coarse grain approach, what we are doing is copying uh, whole chunks of uh, data from the MRAM to WRAM and then we perform the strided accesses um, in WRAM, as you can see in this uh, inner loop here. And then, and finally, we write back the, the, the whole chunk of the, of the uh, output array to the, to the MRAM. However, in the fine grain approach, instead of bringing the data, the whole chunk of data to WRAM and striding uh, on it in WRAM, what we do is accessing only the data that um, is actually needed. So in this case, we have a, this external loop um, that uh, um, uh, we access data with a certain stride, we calculate the index, and by using this index, we go to uh, MRAM read uh, one single element, in this case uh, of size 64 bits, an integer of 64 bits, and then we write it to the uh, corresponding output destination. <clears throat> 
So uh, let's compare these two approaches, the pore string and the fine grain striated approaches. And let's also uh, check what's the uh, bandwidth that the um, uh, random access benchmark uh, can achieve. So um, here in the plot, uh, Y axis is sustained membrane bandwidth. In the Y axis, we have here the um, stride for the coarse grain striated approach. And uh, on the uh, right uh, plot, we see also the stride. And in the last column, we are going to see the results for uh, random accesses. These are the results. And uh, the first observation is that there is a large difference in maximum sustained bandwidth between coarse grain and fine grain DMA. Uh, we see that, well, coarse grain in the best case can achieve more than 600 megabytes per second, while the fine grain approach, it's around 70 megabytes per second. The reason for that is that in the coarse grain DMA approach, we are transferring large chunks to WRAM. And for these large chunks, uh, we can use large uh, DMA transfers. In this case, we are using transfers of 1,024 bytes. However, in the fine grain approach, we are reading only the values that we need. So in this case, we are using uh, small transfers of eight bytes. And if you recall the uh, results that we presented for single DMA transfers, uh, you will see um, that this uh, makes perfect sense. For random access, uh, as you can also see in the plot, the uh, maximum sustained bandwidth is very similar to the fine grain uh, strided approach because the random access uh, microbenchmark also uses this fine grain approach. It just goes to, to MRAM to read the values that are really, are really needed by the program. Okay, so another observation is that the sustained MRAM bandwidth of coarse grain DMA decreases as the stride increases. And the reason for that is that the effective utilization of the transfer data decreases as the stride becomes longer. So in our experiments, what we do is moving a large chunk of data to WRAM, and then we stride in WRAM, right? So this means that if the stride is, for example, four, we are only using one fourth of the data that we are transferring, which means that the effective bandwidth is one fourth of the maximum that we could achieve. And this is uh, what also explains that at some point, the fine grain DMA approach can achieve higher bandwidth than the coarse grain DMA approach. In, uh, concretely for our experiments, we notice this uh, for a stride of 16 or, or larger. So um, this uh, number here, 77.86, corresponds to a stride of eight, which is still uh, slightly higher than this uh, 72.58 for the fine grain DMA approach. But when the um, stride is 16, because we are only using 1 16 of the, of the bandwidth, this uh, means that 1 16th of these uh, 622 megabytes per second, which is the maximum that we have measured for the coarse grain approach, um, is uh, smaller. This 16th is smaller than the 72.58 megabytes per second that we measure for the fine grain approach. So uh, programming recommendation number four for strided access patterns with a stride smaller than 16 eight byte elements, it's better to fetch a large contiguous chunk of, for example, 1024 byte, and then perform the strided accesses in WRAM uh, for larger strides and random access pattern. Um, it's uh, better to fetch only the data elements that are really needed by the uh, DPU. And uh, again, you can find uh, the micro benchmarks uh, in our repository for strided and for random accesses. So now we are going to uh, take a closer look at the interaction between the execution on the pipeline and the access to MRAM. And um, uh, we want to do that because our goal is to characterize what are the memory bound and compute bound regions of the DPU. Uh, we create a microbenchmark. In this microbenchmark, we load one chunk uh, of an array from uh, MRAM to WRAM. Then we perform a variable number of operations on every element in this uh, uh, chunk of data that we have in WRAM. And finally, we write back uh, to MRAM. Uh, this experiment is inspired by the uh, roofline model, which is a 
popular methodology where we represent the performance versus the operational or arithmetic intensity. In our work, we define the operational intensity as the number of arithmetic operations performed per byte accessed from MRAM. And we measure it in operations per byte. Um, one um, thing to consider in advance is that uh, in, in these experiments, the latency uh, in the pipeline, the latency of execution of arithmetic operations in the pipeline changes with the operational intensity because uh, the more, uh, the higher operational intensity, uh, we will have to execute more arithmetic operations and, and accesses to, to WRAM, which will um, increase the uh, uh, resulting pipeline latency. However, the, um, the latency of the accesses to MRAM is fixed because we always move the same amount of data between MRAM and WRAM. So um, in this slide, you can see the, the micro benchmark that uh, we have used. Uh, here we have the MEM read, um, um, MRAM read, copy from MRAM to WRAM. Then uh, here we have the inner loop where we uh, perform uh, repeated operations on each element of the buffer that we have in WRAM, and then we write back. Uh, so the number of repetitions is uh, determined by the an, an input parameter. Input repeat is this. If this input repeat is greater, equal or greater than one, uh, indicates the number of repetitions per uh, input element. If it's uh, a number smaller than one, uh, it indicates the fraction of uh, elements that are going to be updated. We are uh, sweeping a lot of these values of operational intensity of this um, input repeat, and we obtain uh, plots like these ones. I, I will explain um, these plots in detail, but first, uh, let me tell you that uh, in the paper and here in the presentation, you can see results for uh, arithmetic throughput versus operational intensity for 32-bit uh, integer addition, 32-bit integer multiplication, and a floating point, 32 bit floating point addition and multiplication. Um, for other data types and operations, we uh, show, we, we see uh, similar trends and, um, and the main conclusions are essentially the same. Let's uh, take a closer look at one of these plots. Uh, here we have in a logarithmic scale, the arithmetic throughput, n mega operations per second, and in the X axis, we have the operational intensity expressed in operations per byte. As you can see, we go from very, very low values. This means uh, one operation every 2048 bytes, which is very, very low. Um, and we go up to uh, eight operations per byte. So um, on, uh, in this uh, dot here, what you can see is the um, arithmetic throughput for these, uh, the lowest operational intensity, one over 2048 for a single tasklet. So one uh, thing we can see is that when we use two tasklets, we manage to increase the arithmetic throughput uh, a little bit, but this value remains constant for higher number of tasklets, as you can see up to. Uh, 16 that we have used in our experiments. So for this very low operational intensity, the uh, arithmetic throughput saturates at only two tasklets. And that's the same um, for higher operational intensities as, as well. Uh, at some point for uh, 1, 000, so 1 over 32 uh, operations per byte, the, bandwidth, the, the arithmetic throughput starts saturating at three tasklets and it uh, remains the same for a higher number of tasklets. So as we increase the number of tasklets, uh, and, and as we increase the operational intensity, the saturation point is also uh, achieved at higher number of tasklets. And uh, at some point with an operational intensity of one fourth, the, um, band, the, the arithmetic throughput the starts saturating at 11 tasklets, and then it remains flat. Uh, for uh, any higher uh, operational intensity. So one thing that we can observe here is that there is a memory bound region um, on the left of the plot uh, where the arithmetic throughput increases with the operational intensity. And there is a compute bound region where the arithmetic throughput is flat at its maximum. Uh, and here we define the uh, throughput saturation point as the um, operational intensity uh, where the transition between the memory bound and the compute bound regions happens. Um, and one observation is that uh, 
uh, even in these experiments that are for addition of 32-bit elements, the throughput saturation point is quite low. So it's as low as one fourth operation per bytes, which means one integral addition per every 32-bit element fetched from uh, NRAM. So um, the observation uh, is similar for, the, for other operations and data types. And uh, we actually observed that the saturation point is even uh, lower for other cases. Um, the arithmetic throughput of the DPU saturates at low or very low operational intensity. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the best case for the uh, integral 32-bit um, addition is uh, one integral addition per 32-bit element. This indicates that the DPU is fundamentally a compute-bound processor. And this way, we expect that most real-world workloads will be compute-bound uh, in the UPMM architecture. And this is something that uh, we have observed um, with our benchmarks, as, uh, as we will show later. Uh, the micro-benchmark is also available in our repository. Okay, so now uh, we are going to start talking about the print benchmarks. I don't know, Honor, if there are any questions. I can take questions at this point, or I can uh, continue uh, the explanation. Uh, let me see. I think uh, we can probably continue. There's a lot of discussion uh, online, which is good, uh, but I don't think there's anything that requires your attention. But I think there's one point that was raised much earlier. I will mention this. So somebody is asking, uh, uh, I think there's, there's still some uh, people considering the difference between the GPU and this architecture. Somebody's mm -hmm. saying, for example, say you have A100 GPUs, they have 40, 80 gigabyte versions. Are they not doing in-memory processing? Maybe you can quickly handle that since they're not doing in-memory processing clearly GPUs today. Uh, no, we, we, we cannot talk about... Uh, in memory processing there because uh, uh, memory uh, is far from the uh, processors in these systems. And, uh, and actually that's one thing that we can observe in, in, in GPUs and in, 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 in many experiments that we're running or research is that uh, for most uh, real workloads these days, GPUs are memory bound and they cannot uh, even uh, feed all the course that we, they have available. And actually this is a trend that goes even worse uh, because um, the uh, number of um, lanes, the number of uh, so-called uh, CUDA cores or, um, or CMD lanes that we have uh, inside the GPU uh, keeps increasing over time, but the bandwidth, even though it increases and even though uh, now they are using uh, HVM2 memories that provide my, uh, higher bandwidth, um, the, the, the ratio between the number of cores that we have on the GPU and the, 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 the bandwidth provided by the global memory of the GPUs, uh, this ratio is becoming worse over time. So, yeah. And, and, and by the way, one uh, more thing is that um, here we are focusing on uh, the UPMEM PIM system, uh, where we have these um, UPMEM DIMMs that are attached to a CPU. Uh, but this idea of using a small processors um, near or closer to the memory uh, could also be applicable to, um, to GPUs as uh, some um, research uh, related work uh, has shown in, the, in, in recent years, providing uh, very good speed ups and energy savings. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I think there will be also results that Juan will show later comparing to GPUs as well as CPUs. And you will see that uh, there are some workloads where the upmem system significantly outperforms the GPUs mm -hmm. uh, because you can, uh, you, you have a high, uh, high, uh, high bandwidth access uh, to large chunks of memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially there's no GPU that's inside a DRAM chip today, but mm -hmm. uh, upmem ha has provided a CPU uh, a pipeline inside a DRAM chip. And that's the major difference. If GPU core goes into a DRAM chip, then the GPU would be in memory also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's one more question, which is, I think, interesting to handle. Maybe we can handle it after, uh, because this is more speculative. Maybe we can handle it after we see the evaluation results comparing to CPU, GPU, as well as power uh, results. But I'll, I'll mention the question, how much time does it take for UpMem to be available in consumer laptops? 
I will, I will not suggest to answer it right now, but maybe we can get back to it after seeing all the results. And the okay, power yeah, I, I think it's a good question to discuss later. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank okay, you. yeah. Um, I'm going to present now the uh, print benchmarks. Um, uh, so what, what I'm going to do here is to um, explain why we have chosen these uh, print benchmarks and also going to take the, the opportunity of uh, explaining briefly how we need to program the DPU kernel. And I'm going to use a couple of our, uh, benchmarks for, for that explanation. So our goal with uh, creating this benchmark suite is to provide a common set of workloads that can be used to evaluate the UPMMP architecture, compare software improvements and compilers, and compare future PIM architectures and hardware among other possible purposes. We have two key selection criteria. Um, we selected workloads from different applications domain, as you will see in the next slide, and we select workloads that are memory bound on conventional process uncertainty architectures, as you will also see. In total, uh, print benchmarks have uh, 14 different workloads and 16 different benchmarks because, because for two of the workloads, we have two different versions. Um, and this is the whole list of uh, print benchmarks. And, and here you can see the different application domains like sparse and dense linear algebra, databases, data analytics, graph processing, neural networks, bioinformatics, image processing. We have two uh, versions of the um, image histogram and uh, parallel primitives like uh, reduction, two versions of prefix sum and uh, matrix transposition. So uh, the first thing that we did was uh, evaluating these workloads on a, a conventional Intel Xeon CPU. And uh, with Intel Advisor, we obtained the roof line model for all these workloads. And um, as you can see in the figure, in the plot, all these workloads uh, fall in the memory bound area of the rule line. So um, in principle, they can benefit from processing in memory since processing in memory typically provides higher bandwidth and uh, lower um, latency of uh, DRAM access. Uh, then, uh, print benchmarks are diverse, as uh, you can see in this uh, table from the paper. They have different memory access pattern, like sequential, strided, and random. Uh, they use different operations and data types, and they also have different communication and uh, synchronization patterns. When we talk about communication and synchronization, uh, we distinguish between intra-DPU and inter-DPU synchronization. For intra-DPU synchronization, the uh, UPM SDK provides uh, some synchronization primitives like barriers, handshakes, and mutexes. Uh, we will briefly talk about them uh, soon. Uh, regarding inter DPU uh, synchronization, uh, and as we um, explained uh, at the beginning, uh, there are uh, different inter DPU uh, communication patterns. Like for example, for uh, result merging these uh, five different benchmarks, or for redistribution of uh, intermediate results, we have here uh, another five benchmarks. Okay, so now let's uh, talk quickly about how to program a DPU kernel. Uh, we are going to focus on the vector addition. Recall uh, our first programming example. We have two input arrays, A and B, and we perform the element-wise addition and store the result in an output array C. So the code looks like this. Um, we, we can very uh, briefly uh, go over it. Uh, because we are running uh, multiple software threads, multiple tasklets inside the DPU, we need an identifier of these tasklets. Um, there is a, this is the size of the vector tile of the, the chunk of the vectors that uh, has been assigned to each DPU. And here we have the, uh, we calculate here the MRAM addresses where the arrays A and B are. Uh, we are also going to use uh, an offset, this uh, base tasklet, which um, is, uh, uh, relates to uh, each of the tasklet IDs. Uh, tasklet IDs. Um, we are going to use it to access the particular data that is going to be processed by each tasklet. We need to allocate the space in WRAM for buffer A and for buffer B. And then um, inside this um, outer loop, we have the uh, transfers from MRAM to WRAM using these uh, MRAM read instructions. Here we perform the vector addition 
uh, calling this uh, function that you will see in the next slide. And, uh, and this is the uh, final transfer from MRAM to WRAM to store the results in the output array C. Uh, this is a, a function for vector addition. It's like what each of the individual tasklets is going to execute after loading the chunks into WRAM. So it will go element by element performing the element wise addition. Uh, let's uh, quickly talk, talk about the tasklets. We have already introduced them. They are the software abstraction of a hardware thread. Um, each tasklet has, can have its own memory space in WRAM. And that's what we do when we use this memalloc um, instruction that you have just seen in the uh, previous slide. But uh, tasklets can also share data in WRAM. So in principle, by sharing pointers, um, any tasklet inside one DPU can access any WRAM um, a space that has been allocated by another um, uh, tasklet inside the same DPU. And tasklets can also synchronize um, in the same DPU using mutexes, for example, to access uh, critical sections, using, uh, using handshakes to communicate um, pairs of tasklets, uh, using barriers to synchronize all tasklets running um, in, in, in the same DPU, or using semaphores. Uh, in order to briefly uh, show how to use some of these um, syn intra-DPU synchronization primitives, we are going to use parallel reduction uh, as an example. So in parallel reduction, uh, we will have uh, a whole uh, input array that is uh, equally partitioned and assigned to DPUs. And then inside each of the DPUs, uh, we will have different tasklets working on reducing different parts of the of this chunk or tile that has been uh, assigned to the DPU, right? So um, in our program, what the uh, tasklets do is first of all, performing computing a local sum. So if uh, tasklet zero, for example, has been assigned this piece of the, of the tile, um, tasklet zero performs the addition, uh, accumulates all these, uh, the values here and obtains uh, finally a local sum. And then uh, we have to uh, reduce these local sums as we will see. So uh, first thing in all code is um, uh, tasklets will go to uh, MRAM to read uh, chunks of the array, loading them into WRAM and then performing the reduction, which essentially, essentially means uh, going over the, all the elements of the um, um, chunk that uh, is uh, stored in WRAM and accumulating in the local sum. And then after they, um, they are done, they copy the local sum into WRAM because they need to combine all these uh, local sum values to reduce all of them into a final value, which will be the, the output of the reduction in that DPU. Um, and this is something that can be done by using a single tasklet. So, um, so here in the first part of the code, what we have is all tasklets inside the DPU uh, running at the same time, reading data from MRAM, obtaining a local sum. And after they are done, they copy the local sum into certain positions in, in WRAM, in this uh, message array. Then they all synchronize to make sure that all the local sums are in WRAM. And then uh, finally, uh, a single tasklet uh, performs the final uh, reduction, as you can see. So this is the barrier and this is the uh, sequential accumulation. So this is one way of performing this final reduction, but another way is using, it, using a more uh, collaborative approach. For example, um, um, uh, the, the, this slide explains uh, vector reduction with different uh, software thread. So for example, here we may have an array of, for example, 16 elements. So we can perform a three base reduction. In the three base reduction, uh, we need uh, a number uh, log n of iterations. So if we have uh, 16 elements in the input array, we will need four iterations to compute the final reduction of these 16 elements. So what you can see here is that uh, in the very first iteration, we have um, um, threads that are uh, reading two elements um, and reducing them, calculating their, um, their sum. And in the next iteration, half of the threads retire and the rest of threads uh, perform another addition and so on. 
So we can implement these uh, tree based reduction using barriers um, uh, in, in an EPU kernel. And, um, and that's, this is uh, actually the code of this uh, tree based reduction. After every iteration, um, tasklets synchronize with a barrier, and then half of the tasklets retire at the end of the iteration. So here at the uh, bottom of this for loop, you see the barrier that um, where all uh, threads will synchronize after each iteration. And then inside um, the loop body, what we have is this um, uh, partial sum where um, tasklets are um, uh, reducing values that are at a certain distance offset. And this offset, offset distance uh, changes uh, over time. So uh, across the different iterations. So this is one of the uh, versions of the tree, so of the reduction that we uh, include in Prim. There is also another one, uh, handshake base, uh, tree base reduction. And in the appendix of the paper, we compare the single tasklet, the barrier base, and the handshake based versions uh, of reduction. So all Prim benchmarks, uh, 16 Prim benchmarks, and also the scripts that we have used for the evaluation are available in our benchmark suite. And now let's uh, take a look at the evaluation of uh, the print benchmarks. So um, in our evaluation, uh, we have used two UPMM-based PIM systems, one with 2,556 2, DPUs, the other one with 640 DPUs. We perform a strong and weak scaling experiments on the larger system. Um, a strong scaling, let me uh, quickly remind you, refers to how the workload scales when we um, increase the number of processors for a fixed problem size. Uh, and weak scaling refers to how the uh, performance of the program varies when we um, uh, increase, vary the number of processes, processors, increase the number of processors, but we use a fixed problem size per processor. Um, for strong scaling, we have performed experiments using a single DPU for different number of tasklets using one entire rank of up to 64 DPUs and using up to 32 ranks. And for weak scaling, we run experiments only on a, on a single rank, as we will see. Uh, besides the strong and weak scaling experiments, we have also performed the comparison to uh, the CPU and the uh, state-of-the-art CPU and GPU for the two UPMM-based PIM systems in terms of performance and, uh, and energy consumption. As you can see, the CPU and GPU that we have used are respectively an Intel Xeon and an NVIDIA uh, Titan 5 GPU, which is uh, one of the most powerful GPUs in the market. Okay, so in the paper and also here in this table, uh, you can find the uh, data sets that we have used for strong and weak scaling experiments. This is strong scaling experiments for one DPU and one rank for 32 ranks. These are the data sets for weak scaling and these are also the uh, transfer sizes that we have used between MRAM and WRAM uh, for reproducibility of our results. Um, all data sets and also scripts that we have used are available in the repository. Okay, so let's start uh, taking a look at the strong scaling results for a single DPU. So in the, in the um, uh, slide, as you can see the results for the 16 benchmarks, um, let's uh, take a closer look. Uh, we have changed in these experiments the number of tasklets uh, to one, so from one to 16 values, one, two, four, eight, and 16, as you can see in the X axis. And then we show the breakdown of the execution time with the execution time on the DPU. So this is the DPU kernel execution time. Uh, Inter-DPU synchronization, or uh, in, in, here in, in, in the inter-DPU synchronization, we also include um, the, in, in some of the benchmarks, the final calculations, for example, that need to be done uh, on the uh, CPU. Um, in this case, uh, vector addition doesn't use in the DPU synchronization. Communication from the CPU to the DPUs, the time that we need for that, and communication uh, of results from the DPU uh, the DPUs to the CPU. And we also show in these plots the speed up of the DPU kernel um, execution over one tasklet as we uh, increase the number of uh, tasklets that we are using inside the same DPU. Okay, so let's take a look at some uh, observations. 
So the first observation here is that the best performing number of tasklets is uh, 16 in most of the cases. Um, we can see that for these benchmarks, uh, the speed up uh, is something between 1.5 and 2. When we increase, when we double the number of tasklets from 1 to 8, uh, and then from 8 to 16, the speed up is uh, something between 1.2 and 1.5. And this is something that makes sense because we know that the task, the, the, the throughput, pipeline throughput saturates before uh, 16 tasklets. It saturates uh, at 11 tasklets. So this leads us to one key observation. A number of tasklets greater than 11 is a good choice for most real world workloads that we have tested. Uh, in, uh, concretely for 16 kernels out of 19 kernels from uh, 16 benchmarks. As you can uh, see, some of the benchmarks contain two kernels. Um, and yeah, so for most of the kernels that we have tested, uh, their performance saturates at 11 or more tasklets. Okay, so another observation is that some of these workloads, uh, benchmarks, don't use intra DPU synchronization primitives, so no overhead from that. In some other cases, uh, the intra uh, DPU synchronization primitives, like uh, maybe mutexes or uh, barriers or handshakes, are used, but uh, their cost is very lightweight. Uh, we, we don't notice much. The best performing number of tasklets um, is uh, 16 in these cases. However, in other cases, we see that there is uh, a lot of contention in these uh, particular uh, three cases, BFS, one of the versions of the histogram, and, uh, and one of the kernels in the transposition, they use mutexes, and this causes uh, contention that uh, affects the performance as we increase the number of tasks. And that's something that we observe, uh, as I said, in one of the versions of um, histogram, so here in this version, we are using a single histogram per DPU or subhistogram, which will be later reduced with other subhistograms from other DPUs in the host CPU. But um, and these um, inside each of the uh, DPUs, we create one subhistogram. And what we can see here is that as we increase the number of tasklets that we are using for this computation, uh, the execution time goes down, but then at some point, uh, it increases again for 16 tasklets. And the reason is that all tasklets are operating on the same um, histogram. And in order to update the beans in this histogram, they need to use a mutex. So uh, the more um, uh, threads uh, or tasklets that we are using, the more contention due to these uh, mutexes. And this makes that the best performing number of tasklets is not the highest in this case. So uh, one observation is that the intensive use of intra DPU synchronization across tasklets may limit the scalability and uh, make that in some cases, the best performing number of tasklets uh, to be lower than 11. Okay. Uh, next uh, observation. There is, uh, there are, very, so, so actually only a couple of cases, but we have detected that there are a couple of uh, uh, benchmarks like the, the add uh, kernel of the scan SSA benchmark that are not compute, compute intensive. And that's why uh, the throughput of these, uh, so the, the, the performance of these um, scan SSA add kernel saturates at eight tasklets and doesn't change for 16 tasklets. Um, and the reason for that is that this is not compute intensive workload. Actually, uh, if you think about it, it's quite similar to uh, the stream and at benchmark that we evaluated before. Um, there is, so we are reading uh, from MRAM and writing to MRAM, but we are only performing one addition per element. So it's not uh, so much compute intensive. Um, and that's why the uh, performance saturates with less than, than 16, less than 11 tasklets. For BS, we observe similar behavior, but um, uh, in most uh, of the workloads that we have tested, uh, that's not the case. So for most real world workloads, they are in the compute bound region. So they will saturate at 11 or more tasklets 
as we uh, observed before. So um, these uh, scan SSA at kernel and DS are kind of exceptions. Okay. Um, next observation is that for these experiments and on one uh, DPU, the amount of time spent on CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers is quite low compared to the time spent on the DPU execution. There is one exception, which is uh, the transpose benchmark because um, in the, 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 this uh, transposition actually requires three steps. And the first step is implicitly done uh, by using uh, data transfers between the CPU and the DPU. And in these data transfers, in the particular configuration that we have tested, we are using a small transfers or of only eight elements. So in that case, if you recall the experiments where we showed how the bandwidth between CPU and DPU changes with the uh, data transfer size, you will see that uh, for such a small uh, number of elements, uh, we are not achieving uh, the full CPU, DPU bandwidth, and that's why uh, we see um, uh, the, this uh, high uh, bar here. So uh, one key observation uh, from these um, experiments is that transferring large data chunks from to the host CPU is preferred uh, for input data and output results uh, due to the higher sustained bandwidth as we already uh, showed in, in the beginning of this talk. Okay, so after um, discussing the results for one DPU, let's talk about the uh, results for one rank. Uh, here we perform a strong scaling experiments on one rank. Now the number of uh, tasklets that we are going to use inside each of the DPUs is the best performing one from the previous experiments. Uh, we fix this number of tasklets per DPU and we vary the number of DPUs from one to 64. So in, in particular, we are using one, four, 16, or six, 64 DPUs. And um, in the experimental results, we show the execution time on the DPUs, the inter-DPU synchronization time for those benchmarks that need it, um, CPU, DPU transfer time, DPU, CPU transfer time, and the speed up of the execution on the DPUs over one DPU. So, um, First observation here is that uh, most of the benchmarks scale linearly with the a number of DPUs. So as we increase, um, as we increase the number of DPUs, we are uh, partitioning the, the the data set across more DPUs. So more DPUs in the system, more performance, and and we see that uh, the, the, it's it's almost linear scaling in most of the cases. But the scaling is sublinear, in particular in two. Um, uh, benchmarks, BFS and NW. In BFS, the reason is that um, there is load imbalance uh, across DPUs due to the uh, irregular topology of uh, the graph that we are using, which is something uh, pretty common in, in most uh, real world graphs. So what, what happens here is that the uh, amount of data to um, process or the amount of nodes to uh, visit by one DPU is higher than for other DPU and they uh, finish at different times. And for Niedelman Bunch, it's um, something different. So, in this case, what happens is that recall that in Niedelman Bunch, as I explained in the beginning of the talk, uh, we are processing a two dimensional matrix diagonal by diagonal, right? So, when we are uh, working on, on, on short diagonals, it makes no sense to use more DPUs. So, even if we are um, um, allocating 64 DPUs, for the very small diagonals, we won't be using all of them. So that's what uh, limits the scalability in the case of uh, NW. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I had a problem with uh, PowerPoint. Can you still, can you still hear me? Uh, yes, yes, you're online. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me open PowerPoint again. <clears throat> 
I'm sorry about this issue. Uh, let me share screen again. I'm sorry uh, because of this. Um, um, I'm sorry about this interruption. I'm trying to go to the, the slide where I was. Uh, hopefully, I will manage to do it before uh, <laughs> before you uh, leave this talk. Uh, hopefully, that won't happen. Seems like. Um, Zoom and PowerPoint consume a lot of uh, the resources of my system. Maybe some processing in memory here could help. Yeah, probably there's a lot of data movement that's choking your yeah. system. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, yeah, so we already talked about the scaling in the uh, one rank um, experiments, strong scaling experiment uh, with one rank. Um, it's coming now. Uh, so uh, recall, uh, for most of the benchmarks, we see linear scaling, but scaling is sublinear for BFS and, and Niedelman Bunch for uh, their own reasons that I already explained. Uh, now we uh, can talk about the uh, inter-DPU synchronization needs. For some of the workloads, we don't need inter-DPU synchronization. In some other workloads, we need the inter-DPU synchronization uh, and even though this uh, entails a, a little bit of overhead, we still achieve the best performance with uh, 64 DPUs, which is the ma maximum number of DPUs that we are using uh, in one rank. Uh, for three of the benchmarks, uh, this may not happen uh, because they require a heavy inter-DPU synchronization. So this is uh, kind of the, the pattern that I explained um, um, at some point in the presentation where we need to use uh, CPU, DPU transfers, and then DPU, DP, uh, CPU, so CPU, sorry, DPU, CPU transfers to gather intermediate results, combine them in the CPU, and then uh, distribute these results, uh, intermediate results, uh, to the DPUs again for further processing. Um, then if we, if we uh, talk about the parallel transfers, so about the data transfers between CPUs and DPUs, uh, one thing that we can observe is that uh, many of these uh, benchmarks can use parallel transfers, which is good because they enjoy higher bandwidth as we increase the number of uh, DPUs. There are two cases that even though we are using parallel transfers, we don't manage to reduce the transfer time. These are BS and NW, but these are because uh, as we are using more DPUs, we need to transfer more data. That's uh, essentially the, the main reason in these two benchmarks. So you can uh, read the exact details um, in, the, in, the, in the paper. And then uh, there are other benchmarks where we cannot use parallel transfers. So for, for example, in select or unique, I remember that in the beginning of the talk, I, I explained select. We, don't, we cannot use parallel transfers in the DPU to CPU transfer. Those need to be serial. And that's uh, something that we uh, clearly notice when we um, observe uh, these um, execution time results. So program recommendation number five, uh, parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers inside a rank of DPUs are recommended for real world workloads uh, when all transferred buffers are of the same size. So recall that uh, that was the uh, main limitation of the parallel transfers. Okay, now we are going to talk briefly about the strong scaling results on 32 ranks. In this case, uh, again, we set the uh, number of tasks to the best performing one and the number of DPUs 
um, is to, uh, 256, 512, uh, 1024, or 2048 DPUs, well, as you can see uh, here in this uh, X axis. This, the, this is the execution time on the DPU and inter DPU synchronization. In this case, we are not showing uh, CPU, DPU transfer times because we know that um, the, the UPM SDK doesn't parallelize across ranks. So that's uh, the reason why we are not showing these transfer times. And, um, and we show the speed up over the execution on, uh, uh, so over the execution on the, 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 the smaller DPU set that we are using here, which is 256 DPUs. Okay, so a uh, few observations about these results. Uh, in most of the cases, we see linear scaling with the number of uh, DPUs. And in some other cases, uh, we don't see linear scaling, but this is uh, due to uh, load imbalance in some way, as, uh, as we have discussed uh, for previous experiments. So load balancing across DPUs ensures linear reduction of the execution time spent on the DPUs uh, for a, a given problem size and uh, when all available DPUs are used. This is what we observe in these uh, experiments with 32 ranks. Okay, one more observation is that uh, uh, th th there are a few benchmarks, these uh, five benchmarks uh, that needs to uh, merge uh, final results. So it's, uh, they need uh, inter DPU synchronization for final results. And in this case, the overhead is uh, pretty lightweight or at least tolerable. Uh, the overhead of merging partial results from DPUs in the host CPU is tolerable across all prim benchmarks that need it. Uh, however, in other cases, we see that this inter DPU synchronization, when we are using such large number of uh, DPUs, uh, becomes uh, more heavyweight. And, uh, and so we observe that complex synchronization across DPUs, and we mean by complex synchronization, synchronization involving two way communication between the uh, DPUs and the CPU, this imposes a significant overhead, which may limit the scalability uh, to more DPUs. In the paper, uh, we also show um, weak scaling experiments on one rank, as I explained before. Uh, here you can see all the results uh, very quickly. One key observation is that equally sized problems assigned to different DPUs and little or no inter DPU synchronization. Uh, lead uh, to uh, linear weak scaling. That's something that we observe, for example, in vector addition. We are increasing the problem with the number of DPUs because the problem size is fixed. Uh, so the problem size is fixed per DPU, but uh, as, as we increase the number of DPUs, the execution time remains uh, completely flat. Um, that's not exactly what happens for um, uh, the, the data transfers, because even though we are able to achieve higher bandwidth as we increase the number of DPUs inside one rank, but um, this uh, bandwidth is scaled sublinearly. So that's why, um, even though it's uh, relatively um, contained, but uh, we, we see that the uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU uh, transfers times uh, tend to increase with the uh, number of DPUs that we are using inside the same run. Okay, so this is all for now uh, regarding strong and weak scaling experiments. You can uh, read uh, more observations and programming recommendations related to these experiments in the paper. Now we are going to take a, a look at the comparison to CPU and GPU. As I said before, we use an Intel Xeon CPU and an NVIDIA Titan 5 GPU. Uh, we uh, compare to CPU and GPU counterparts of the print benchmarks. Uh, these uh, CPU and GPU codes are also available in our repository. Um, the, the data set that we are using uh, is the largest data set that we can fit uh, in the GPU memory. So this is also something uh, important to consider with respect to our experiments. Uh, we could we would be able to use much larger data sets, for example, in the UPMM based system with uh, 2,500 uh, DPUs because it has uh, 160 gigabytes of, uh, of uh, memory, uh, which is like five or 10 times more than uh, the most powerful uh, GPUs. But um, I mean, and, and, and if we were using larger data sets, this would require to 
move data more frequently between the CPU memory and the GPU. But that's not uh, what, we, what we are uh, using. We consider that a more fair comparison um, is a comparison that uh, uses the largest data sets that we can fit inside the GPU memory. And, and also, uh, one more thing to take into account is that when we are reporting uh, execution times on the UPMM based team systems, we are including the execution time on the uh, DPU themselves, on, the, on the, the DPU kernel time, and also the cost of inter DPU communication. And that's, uh, as we will see, what makes that for some of the benchmarks, the GPUs are even, or even the CPUs are, um, are, are, are better than the UPMM based PIN system. So here in the plot, uh, you will first see, we are going to first uh, analyze uh, performance. Um, here, this plot shows uh, a speed up over the uh, CPU in a logarithmic scale. And the X axis, we have the different benchmarks. We have divided them into more pin suitable and less pin suitable. We will talk about their uh, characteristics soon. So these are the more pin suitable ones less pin suitable, and these are the geomine for both groups and the overall geomine. So one first observation here is that the both UPMM based pin systems, the one with uh, more than 2,500 DPUs and the one with uh, 640 DPUs outperform the CPU for all benchmarks except three of them, uh, SPMB, BFS, and NW. And uh, for these uh, 13 print benchmarks, the UPMM based pin systems are 93, time, 93 times and 27.9 times faster than the CPU, which are uh, quite significant speed ups. Um, in the comparison to the GPU, what we can see is that the larger uh, UPMM based pin system outperforms the GPU for 10 print benchmarks with an average of uh, 2.54 times. And for the same uh, 10 benchmarks, uh, the performance of the 600 DPU system is within 65% the performance of the GPU. And uh, the interesting thing here is what are the common characteristics of these, what we have called more pin suitable workloads. They have three key characteristics. The first one is that they use streaming memory accesses. And this is important because this way we can exploit more bandwidth between the MRAM and the WRAM. The second key characteristic is that there is uh, no inter-DPU synchronization or little amount of the uh, inter-DPU synchronization. So there is no uh, complex uh, communication pattern that requires um, uh, many uh, transfers in, in, in both directions. Um, and also there is no or little use of uh, integer multiplication, integer division, or floating point operations with, uh, which are um, costlier than um, integer addition and subtraction as we saw when we were analyzing the arithmetic throughput of the DPUs. So we believe that these three characteristics um, determine when a workload can be potentially suitable to the UPMM uh, based PIM system. In terms of uh, energy, we only show results for the smaller uh, UPMM based system with 640 DPUs uh, because the larger one doesn't support uh, energy measurement yet. Um, these are the results for uh, the more pin suitable workloads, the less pin suitable workloads, and the geomine values. Uh, one observation here is that on average, the UP, uh, 64, uh, 60, um, 6, 640 DPU system consumes 1.64 less energy than the uh, CPU for all uh, 16 print benchmarks. And, and actually for 12 of these benchmarks, uh, the energy savings are 5.23 times, which is uh, quite high. Uh, so one uh, key observation is that the UPMM PIM based, uh, UPMM based PIM system provides large energy, energy savings over a state-of-the-art CPU due to higher performance and thus uh, lower static energy and you do the less data movement between the memory and the processors. One observation um, is that uh, the UPMM based pin system can provide energy savings over state-of-the-art CPU and GPU uh, for those workloads where it outperforms the CPU and the GPU and the key reason for that is that the uh, reduction in the energy consumption as well as the 
performance improvement comes from the reduced data movement between the memory and the uh, execution units that uh, PIM systems can provide. So um, this is all regarding the evaluation. Um, I can uh, finalize the presentation with some uh, key takeaways uh, that stem uh, from our work. So key takeaway number one uh, relates to the memory bound and the compute bound regions that we have observed in the, in the um, DPUs. The throughput saturation point is uh, as low as uh, one fourth or even lower. So one fourth is uh, operations per byte is for the integral addition of 32 bit elements. And this leads us to key takeaway number one, the UPMMP architecture is fundamentally compute bound. And uh, as a result, we expect that the most suitable workloads uh, for this architecture are workloads that are memory bound in conventional architectures. Key takeaway number two relates to our comparison to CPU and GPU. We observe that the most well-suited workloads for the UPMMP architecture use no arithmetic operations or use only simple operations like, for example, bitwise operations or integer addition and subtraction that provide a higher throughput as we observe. Key takeaway number three, the most well-suited workloads for the UPMMP architecture require little or no communication across DPUs, uh, what we call the inter-DPU communication. And finally, key takeaway four, the UPMM-based PIN system outperform um, state-of-the-art CPUs in terms of performance and energy efficiency of most of the PRIM benchmarks on 13 out of 16 PRIM benchmarks as we have seen in, uh, in the previous slide. Um, also, they uh, outperform uh, GPUs on, on a majority of benchmarks, um, in, in particular, the larger UPMM-based PIN system outperformed the GPU on 10 of the 16 uh, PRIM benchmarks. And we believe that the outlook is even more positive for future PIN systems. And uh, finally, UPMM-based PIN systems are more energy efficient than state-of-the-art CPUs and GPUs on workloads that they provide performance improvements because the source, the main source, uh, of both energy savings and performance improvements is the reduced uh, data movement between memory and execution units that uh, PIM systems can provide. So I can uh, wrap up uh, by reviewing the executive summary that I showed in the beginning of the talk. Uh, data movement is a major contributor to the execution time and the energy consumption. And one way of dealing with, with this data movement bottleneck is the processing in memory paradigm that is an old paradigm, but there were many technology challenges that prevented from uh, the materialization of this paradigm. UPMEM is uh, the first company that has fabricated and commercialized uh, commercializes uh, a, a PIM architecture. Um, as you have seen, these are uh, DDR4 chips that uh, embed uh, a small course called DRAM processing units. In our work in, and in this presentation, we have provided an introduction to the UPMMP architecture and programming model. We have uh, analyzed uh, the um, uh, architecture of the, uh, the DRAM processing units or DPUs, and we provide a, a benchmarking and workload suitability study. Our main contributions are the comprehensive characterization of the architecture and the first uh, benchmark suite for a real world processing in memory architecture, which is called PRIM and contains 16 workloads that we have characterized using a strong and weak scaling experiment. And we have compared them to their CPU and GPU counterparts. Uh, takeaways that our work provides are workload characteristics uh, for PIN suitability, as uh, we have just discussed, some programming recommendations, suggestions, and hints uh, for future PIN systems. And uh, programming samples, print can be programming samples and also can be used for evaluation and comparison of current and future uh, processing in memory systems. Uh, all the details are in our paper that is uh, available online, as I said in the beginning, and our, our, all our codes are in the uh, print repository. Um, that's all. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I apologize again for this um, issue that I had with uh, PowerPoint. Uh, now I would be glad uh, to take questions or
uh, start uh, any discussion uh, that may come from these questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Juan, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I don't see a lot of questions uh, in the chat, but maybe uh, there are people who are here who want to ask questions. So it'd be good to have a discussion. Are there any questions from anyone? Maybe I have a question then to, just to warm up uh, people. It'd be good uh, to have some more questions, of course. If you go to the main results slides that compare uh, OpMem system to the CPU and GPU. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one, if you can show the like results also. I think there was uh, a result showing the improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let me find the exact yeah, slide. So I don't want your PowerPoint to crash again due to <laughs> bottlenecks, but <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so here we can see uh, some results of the comparison to the okay. CPU. Okay, yeah. So uh, if, if you look at 13 of the prim benchmarks, 13 out of 16, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a like between uh, one to two orders of magnitude improvement in terms of performance. But there's, uh, which, is, which is really good, of course. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that the benefits are coming from uh, eliminating the data movement overheads, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, I think. One is how much does, uh, how, how much more could you gain? Like what is the potential uh, on the DPU side, let's say? Is this the best you can get or what else can you improve on the DPU for those suitable workloads? Uh, so let's start with the suitable ones, PIM suitable mm -hmm. ones. So what, what for... else is missing basically for the suitable ones so that you can get more than two orders of magnitude improvement, let's say, in terms of performance? So for uh, so first of all, I think that uh, upcoming generations are going to be able to run at a little bit uh, higher frequency. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as I know, uh, so current one uh, is uh, 350 megahertz. Uh, next one, as far as I know, uh, can reach up to 450 megahertz. So for sure, uh, some uh, improvement is going to come from that. Mm -hmm. um, then, um, even though these workloads, uh, so the, the, the more pin suitable workloads uh, don't use uh, costly operations massively, like for example, multiplication, uh, we still need to use multiplication to do address calculation. So if there were a way of uh, optimizing those multiplications or um, accelerating those other calculations that could be uh, beneficial for sure uh, for the overall performance. And in some other uh, workloads, uh, even though there may not be uh, so much communication, but still there is uh, some communication that is necessary across uh, DPUs, like for example, the scan kernels. Uh, so SCAM, these two SCAM benchmarks that, uh, I mean, you, you see that they are quite good in the comparison to CPU and GPU, but, uh, but still there is uh, some uh, uh, inter-DPU communication here and enabling some at least uh, partial um, inter-DPU communication with a more direct communication channel uh, would uh, definitely benefit. Uh, the overall performance, for example, inside the same um, uh, inside the same uh, pin chip where we have eight DPUs, uh, we know from uh, related work that this uh, relatively is feasible to enable uh, a communication channel and and that good um, uh, benefit for sure. And then another thing that uh, can be beneficial for these workloads as well is that. Uh, so in some in some of these cases, we need to use uh, serial transfers between the CPU and the DPUs or vice versa, because uh, the, 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 the data that we are transferring uh, between main memory and, and the different membrane banks is of different size. Um, so uh, if it were possible to have parallel transfers with uh, irregular sizes, that could definitely uh, improve the performance as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I, I'll, I'll pick on the multiplication aspect. I think these are all very good points, but how much uh, multiplication is really done in the address computation of these workloads? Is it really multiplication or is it mainly shifting? 
uh, yeah, in, in some of the cases, it may be replaced by shifting, but it depends on how you program the workload as well, right? So uh, we, we have written the workloads in a way that uh, we, we can use a variable size. So in not all the cases, we can use shifting. Okay. And in those cases, we need to use multiplication, same as we need to do uh, more bound checking that is uh, also uh, increasing the pipeline latency. Okay. Okay, one other question is, uh, what about uh, the WRAM size? WRAM is the scratch pad. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how much of a limiter is it in terms of this performance? Um, it can be, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that uh, it may limit uh, in some uh, cases. Uh, we have been trying, for example, uh, some optimizations that we uh, haven't been able to uh, implement completely because we would require a little bit more WRAM. Um, um, that's uh, something that we have observed. Uh, I also mentioned uh, at some point that uh, we, we need to be careful with the amount of WRAM that we allocate because we may exhaust it if we are allocating, for example, three, four large uh, uh, buffers uh, in WRAM per tasklet, uh, we will end up uh, having to reduce the number of tasklets uh, that we run on the on the DPU, and this may cause that uh, we are not even able to uh, reach eleven tasklets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in that sense, uh, WRAM may limit the performance. Okay, yeah, I think it's good to think about it, perhaps. Uh because there's still some locality to be exploited, right? Even though mm -hmm. you're inside the memory. I think I have one more question slash comment. Uh, maybe you said this, but it's good to emphasize that uh, some of these work uh, these workloads are not necessarily uh, heavily optimized for the upmem architecture, right? I, I think that's true, especially for BFS, because we had this discussion uh, quite mm -hmm. a bit. BFS seems like it loses a lot of performance, but maybe VFS is uh, at, uh, actually, it's probably true uh, that VFS is run at a point uh, that's not very optimal for the architecture. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I agree on that. I mean, these uh, workloads, so the, 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 the main issue with uh, BFS seems to be the inter DPU communication mm -hmm. when it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, whenever you need such a pattern, um, yeah, you will be burdened. The performance of the workload will be burdened on the UPMM based pin system, and especially when we increase uh, the number of uh, DPUs, right? As, as we have observed. Um, but, but still, uh, there may be other approaches that reduce this uh, data movement. And, and that's also uh, something that uh, we are exploring or uh, want to explore in, in, in uh, future projects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so one other thing, as, as you mentioned as well, uh, the workloads, the benchmarks at, are not uh, fully optimized. Let's say that this is, so this is a benchmark suite. So uh, from our understanding, it doesn't really make sense to uh, try to optimize and, and tune the uh, codes as much as possible. And, um, and, and, and make the optimizations very specific for a particular architecture. We believe that it makes more sense to apply, uh, let's say like uh, general uh, optimizations that can apply to different parallel systems or different uh, processing in memory systems in this case. Uh, so yeah, definitely there is a still uh, room for uh, optimization in these workloads. Same as uh, in the uh, CPU and, and GPU uh, counterparts, we have, we have also used uh, versions of our codes that come from uh, popular uh, benchmark suites or, or uh, libraries, and they may not be also uh, optimized at their maximum, but still we believe that they are representative. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, I think. I, I'm picking on BFS because if inter-DPU communication is a, a huge bottleneck, then maybe you don't want to run everything uh, with uh, many threads, right? Maybe you mm -hmm. scale down. Like going from 640 to, to 2,556 seems like a not good idea in BFS. Like if you stayed at just 640, you would have 
probably gotten the same performance as the 640 DPU machine, mm -hmm. perhaps, right? Plus the benefits of the frequency and other improvements. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. it's good to see these numbers with a grain of salt. They, uh, there, there's a lot of potential for improvement, I think, in the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the workload uh, to be customized to the architecture. I think if you go to the GPU results, there's one question. Uh, maybe uh, there's, there was on report, uh, yeah, there was a banner reporting the results, yeah. So there's a significant benefit uh, overall. So there's uh, one question from Ant Antonio Pena saying, any reason why you didn't use a Tesla GPU for comparison? Um, no, there's no reason. I guess that uh, it's because the Titan 5 is, uh, is the one that uh, uh, we have access to. But um, so the main difference between uh, Tesla GPU and this uh, Titan 5 uh, is uh, so maybe, so for example, the main difference between the Volta V100, which is the corresponding Tesla of the uh, same uh, generation, the main difference is the uh, peak bandwidth in double precision, so peak uh, throughput in uh, double precision floating point operations. And, uh, and I think that we are actually not using uh, peak, so uh, um, double precision floating point in any of our workloads. I believe that the only one where we use floating point computation is uh, SPMB and there is uh, um, single precision. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we can check the detail in the paper, but, but no, so the, there is no, reason for not using uh, Volta V100, for example, in our experiments instead of Titan 5. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe if I elaborate on that, it's hard to do a perfectly fair comparison on real systems, right? Because uh, clearly uh, these are of different technology nodes, different generations, uh, different maturity in terms of uh, how much design effort has been put into a particular system over decades and decades. So CPUs and GPUs have been heavily optimized for uh, so certainly more than a decade now, GPUs, but CPUs have been decades and decades, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas this DPU is just, uh, this is uh, the first incarnation and the second incarnation we're looking at. And their technology nodes are clearly higher uh, than mm. uh, existing GPUs and CPUs. So I think over time, if if uh, you can scale uh, the technology in a DPU and make it more mature, uh, maybe a, a future point would be a more fair comparison. So a state-of-the-art GPU, in my opinion, is an interesting comparison point, yes, but maybe not a perfectly fair comparison because of how much effort has been put into uh, those, let's say, conventional technologies versus this uh, budding technology that has not had as much design effort, fabrication effort, et cetera, put into it, right? Mm, yeah, That's I completely agree, agree with that. On, um, yeah. GPUs and CPUs have been optimized for decades. They use uh, lower technology nodes, and this um, is definitely um, uh, a handicap for the UPMM-based beam systems. Uh, still, the UPMM-based beam systems uh, have an advantage, which is the fact that they provide a large amount of beam enabled memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and actually this amount of uh, memory is, uh, is, a, is an issue in, um, in GPUs, for example, uh, where the biggest size that uh, we have nowadays are 32 gigabytes. And this may require that for some uh, workloads and for some data sets, we cannot feed the entire data sets in the GPU memory. So we need to oversubscribe, which requires going to the CPU memory. And this uh, entails the costly data transfers over NVLink or PCI Express bus that definitely burden the uh, performance of the GPU as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, I guess maybe people can develop other workloads that show that benefit, right? Uh, the, the, no. the benefit, the benefit. Or do you see that? Do you see that in any of the workloads here? Uh, so that, that's something that we could uh, we could uh, try with the, with these benchmarks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so, for example, in the simplest case, vector addition, we could uh, uh, in, instead of using vectors that uh, fit in the GPU memory, we could use much larger inputs 
and, uh, and have to go back and forth between the GPU memory and the CPU memory where, where we would have uh, the whole arrays. Um, we didn't want to uh, show results uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, with such huge data sets, mm -hmm. uh, not because they may not be uh, representative or realistic, which I believe that in most cases they will be realistic, but also because uh, I don't think, so it would somehow uh, provide some uh, results and maybe even uh, conclusions that may be misleading. Uh, and here uh, we are more interested in um, uh, in comparing the, uh, DPU systems and uh, GPUs mm -hmm. from the point of view of the available bandwidth in both systems and the uh, arithmetic throughput that can be achieved uh, on them. Yeah, yeah, but I think the comparison that you mentioned could, would be very interesting uh, for uh, uh, for future work uh, mm -hmm. because you can actually get. Uh, a more whole, whole system level result, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a very good start for, for sure, but maybe it's good to also look at a whole system level result with the very large data sets and how, mm -hmm. which, uh, how different systems can accommodate those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, I we think... are considering that, uh, those cases in, in some uh, follow-up projects. Okay, sure. So I think we have, we have a guest uh, also here, Fabrice Davo, who is, the, who is the, essentially the chief architect of the UpMem system. And I think he may have some comments on this topic as well on GPUs. Fabrice, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, yes, uh, it just um, um, it, it sorry, uh, it just a, of matter that the concept is at some time to have memories that have calculation capabilities, which is something different than to say you want to build and buy uh, specific accelerators. GPUs will always uh, uh, be bought uh, on a, for a specific, not a specific um, purpose of workloads, but you you want you, you will want to buy them because you need them. The idea with Spim, uh, at least that's the idea we have at UpMem, is that we we could reach a point where a clever memory, a memory capable of calculation, will be not that much expensive with respect to classical memories. And so the, the comparison, uh, the thing is uh, for us is this one, is comparing a system with standard DRAMs uh, versus a system with upmem DRAMs. And at some point in the future, we hope to reach uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, cost that will allow to, uh, that uh, go towards this, this direction, which is fundamentally a, a matter of, of volume, uh, because uh, the increase in manufacturing cost is not uh, is really manageable. I mean that the chip is a little bigger, the test uh, you test a little more, and, and so on, but. That's not the same thing that the GPUs, which today has the HBM memory, which is extremely expensive, stacks and so on. You won't ever be able to get the cheap GPU uh, or uh, beside the embedded ones, okay, uh, in, the, in, the, in the CPU chip. So the, that's the key premise of the, from my point of view of the PIM technology is this one, is to get at some point in your everyday DRAM processors, uh, that that are very cheap with respect to the what they, they provide. That makes yeah. sense to me. Uh, this this also I think plays uh, well into the question that was asked earlier. When will we have uh, up memory in our laptops? Right? <laughs> is that the goal, or is that uh, are you are oh, you thinking uh, of more? <laughs> you, you see, the risk five, the say, the goal is total domination. <laughs> so I will say that uh, our goal is total per pervasiveness, and uh, because uh, we can provide calculation benefits everywhere. Uh, and another thing is the security. I mean that when you have uh, your processor into your DRAM to establish extremely strong security inside is very easy compared to your big G uh, GPU or CPU or whatever. So uh, definitely we, uh, 
we don't see a reason why PIM will not uh, become mainstream in the year to come. Yeah, that, may, that makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, this I think this uh, what you mentioned security. There have been some questions about it also, uh, like what uh, uh, potential side channels uh, is, does this eliminate the side channels? Uh, uh, I think that's, okay. <laughs> the, um... In terms of security, okay, the grand generation is, has no security enabled, but the uh, further generation is coming, which will have it. Uh, and the key idea is that since you have so many DPUs in a typical system, you won't ever time share a DPU. I mean, you can you can have an application which use DPUs, then uh, give this DPU back to the to the DPU management system because they don't need them anymore. But you want timeshare and, and the fine grain, the things you do typically on the CPU. So you don't have side channels uh, per definition because, because the things is never used for two things at the same time. Uh, so th there is uh, probably no side channels. Uh, we believe this is a very strong property, and uh, the security implication of this could be could be very significant. So that's the reason why we add security for the next chip, and uh, the, the the cost of doing so in terms of area is negligible. So, so when when you say you you will have security for the next chip, can you elaborate on the features that you have in mind? Um, okay, so upmem roadmap is still uh, <laughs> not yeah. general public information. Mm -hmm. The thing I can say is that effectively we will get better frequency very soon. Uh, and uh, then we, we think of uh, having uh, more bandwidth, more, okay, slightly more frequency, possibly super scalar something. And uh, Okay, so we have all these, uh, we have a, a very consequent roadmap because we, we have, uh, uh, we feel more confident to do more things more complex. Not to say that the chip is not complex today, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I mean, we, we have certainly a very ambitious roadmap uh, concerning the performance, the security. Uh, Possibly uh, uh, operators uh, that will be uh, targeting some markets or the the the, the usual stuff, <laughs> I will say. Yeah. So um, yes, PIM is really uh, a game changer on uh, um, okay, which which will be not necessarily uh, in opposition to GPU. We, we can even uh, envision GPUs uh, using uh, memory which are PIMS enabled. Uh, so that's uh... sure. Um, I, I, okay. so, excuse me, Remy from uh, from UpMem as well. Uh, Fabrice also maybe on the roadmap because it's a, a concern of a few people uh, in the questions is also using uh, UpMem PIM as main memory, right? Is something that we are also putting on our roadmap. Uh, yes. By the way, upmem memories are currently the only memories, DRAM memories, I would say on Earth, <laughs> uh, that have no ROAMer. We have a Python TED first generation anti ROAMer system on board, and we have de developed a second generation system for uh, more finer processes, which are even more. Uh, susceptible to warmer, and effectively, uh, your next memory will be you, you will be able to use it as a standard standalone memory with no warmer. Uh, okay, so <laughs> for uh, security minded people, that that will be a plus. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there was a question on this, so it's great that you uh, handled that also. Any other questions or comments? I think one question, one other question uh, that's interesting uh, is uh, uh, so Manisha asks if we want to use uh, this as an application specific machine, is it possible to remove the host CPU and main memory entirely uh, 
and do all the processing, of course, with some modification of the DPU itself? Um, we, we believe one very strong aspect of this, of this product is the fact that you can plug it in a regular, uh, in a regular uh, systems. Uh, you could always imagine having um, an ASIC and FPGA specialized to, for, to, to deal with PIM, to, mm -hmm. to interface with PIM uh, up -man, up chips. That's certainly feasible. Mm -hmm. um, we intend to, to continue to be able on mainstream uh, memory protocols. So DDR4, uh, DDR5, uh, or whatever memory protocols will be relevant to, to the market we, we, we follow. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, but I think what you mentioned, certainly someone can uh, take an FPGA, a designer board, and make it compatible with OpMem and Use well, it as an accelerator, right? <laughs> the the compatibility is very simple. Yeah. It's just to to you have a DDR4 uh, DDR4 interface, mm -hmm. um, and just to, to have the kind of capabilities that the, the this kind of memory controllers have. The fact that you can flush the have queues. Okay. So when you do PIMS calculation, you need to flush the queues of the memory controller at some point. So. But this is a features that you will find commonly on, on any um, memory controller IP, or I would say probably memory controllers, uh, 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 hard memory controllers embedded in big FPGAs and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I may, maybe the question also opens the door uh, to edge computing, right? Is it maybe uh, something that we, we can talk about Fabrice a little bit? Oh, but it, it's go down to security again. I mean that uh, um, um, when you have a, an edge computer, the, okay, you 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 fear for for it a, a lot. <laughs> so uh, effectively, uh, we have projects on this area with, with partners, we, which are very security minded people, and effectively. Uh, there is a problem of considering that the complexity of current uh, big CPU uh, make uh, having a com complete leak proof security probably unachievable. So um, for, for certain people, uh, it's, it's, it's important to have uh, the capability to have some, I will say a simple security, which will be an effective one because uh, the security, uh, the complexity defeats the security. That's really the, the things. Uh, but don't, uh, just one point, uh, don't think making a CPU on the RAM, okay, it's a small uh, uh, RIS-5 with three pipe stage or something. No, uh, unfortunately, it, uh, um, it is still complex to make a DPU on this kind of process. Uh, really, <laughs> that's that's the reason why we there's not uh, that many before us. So, um, um, but now that you have it, hopefully it'll improve over generations and become absolutely. Mm. As I said, we we feel more confident. Okay, we were extremely cautious because you see all the people before the project just didn't succeed in the sense that the chip didn't work. Uh, was not manufacturable, or that, that's just a story. So when you see that many projects which have, which have failed, you, you are very cautious about the things you, you, you put into your architecture. And then, then we have done this once successfully, then we, we improve things and okay, because um, um, that's the way it's work. I mean, you always improve on, upon what you have first done and, and it's very important to have a reasonable goal at the first iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, reasonable in my mind, and because if I uh, got one dollar every time I has been told it was not feasible, um, uh, <laughs> we will be self-funded. <laughs> so, uh, um, but um, sure. Thanks, Fabrice. So so I, one I, question I, that I don't have uh, for you, Fabrice. Uh, one, one thing that we observe is that the uh, more uh, pin suitable workloads, these are that are uh, surrounded by the um, by the green 
uh, up from in the in the slide. So they don't use, uh, or at least not heavily, uh, complex operations like uh, multiplication, uh, division, or floating point operations. Um, also, if we uh, think about the FinDiran uh, system from Samsung that was uh, recently presented, and uh, you remember that we have talked about that as well uh, in your meme talk. Um, so there, the number of uh, operations that are available are, are, are more limited, right? Because they are targeting a specific class of applications. Could the uh, UPMM based PIM system benefit from maybe reducing the, general, the generality of the processors in some way? I'm not uh, proposing any uh, concrete direction, but uh, uh, in some case, could these uh, more PIM suitable workloads, for example, be even more uh, PIM, <laughs> PIM suitable and achieve even more performance improvement with respect to CPU or, or DPUs if we simplify the design in some way? Um, okay, I will say that since we are speaking uh, of uh, scalar in order, uh, CPU, okay, in order is a given, we will stay in order. Um, in fact, the CPU is even not exactly in order because we have this thread and sometimes threads jumps over uh, on another because, uh, because of reasons. Uh, <laughs> so, um, we have um, uh, very good opportunities of Im improving the performance of our architecture without going first for specialized operators. I mean that every gate is 10 times bigger than on a logic process. That's something you, you have to keep in mind. So, I, I would prefer executing more instruction per cycle and at an higher frequency. And I would prefer, and I, I, I do prefer uh, aiming the transistor budget at these targets, which will benefit all workloads uh, before going for the specialized operators. You go for the specialized operators when you have run, run out, out of steam on all the regular uh, instruction acceleration, see the big 86. I mean, now they have vectors units, but they have your vector unit because they have already a number of uh, parallelisms on general purpose instruction, which is where you don't have a, a positive return. I mean that it is not uh, uh, possible to make out of order processor with more units, more uh, uh, reorder windows and so on. Then you aim your, your budget to specialized operators. We are so, so, so far from, uh, from this point that we, we, we aim first at uh, general purpose uh, performance improvement. Uh, if there is a market which is very significant, very demanding for some kind of specific acceleration, that's something we can think of. But currently we believe the best is to provide something which is very resilient. I mean, a solution where we provide performance on a very wide variety of workloads. Uh, and that will be the counterpoint to the GPUs. I mean, GPUs do not jump. Uh, if you make conditional cuts and so on, things like this, then suddenly, uh, uh, the, the crash and burn. Okay, so so that uh, I, I just the, considering this is the first iteration, the next iteration will aim at general purpose performance improvement, and I believe this is a, a soon strategy. Okay, I, I have one question for Juan. If you go to the energy results, Juan, uh, they all uh, they also look quite. Uh, promising, of course. And you mentioned that energy results perform the uh, oh, follow um, fo follow the performance results, which makes sense. Okay, if you yeah, okay. Uh, uh, maybe this is a question some other people may be asking also. Like, why don't you have results for uh, the larger system over here? Uh, it'd be good yeah, to, it'd be good to see the scaling property of the energy. Uh, 
I, I completely <laughs> agree, and uh, and we tried. It's something that I uh, briefly mentioned when I presented the, these results. Mm -hmm. uh, we could not uh, do, do these measurements on the larger system. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't support it currently. We we have been um, in touch with uh, UPMN engineers to. Mm -hmm. Uh, figure out a way of uh, doing this measurement, but uh, so far it has not been possible. For sure, we will do it as soon as uh, as it's possible. But it's still, uh, I think that uh, by showing these uh, results for the smaller system, and uh, if we correlate what we see here with the uh, performance results that we have in the previous slides, I think that is possible to um, project. Uh, in some way, what are the uh, energy savings that the larger system could provide? And, and I really believe that these are promising as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. Uh, yeah, it'd be great to see the results when, uh, when the measurement infrastructure becomes available for the larger yeah. system. It's, it certainly will be better, if, uh, cert uh, right, clearly, but it's good, it'd be good to uh, quantify it uh, as well. Because I think one I of agree. the... One of the big benefits of processing in memory systems is clearly energy uh, in addition to performance. So you get both energy and performance improvements and it's good to show, it, show, show both in the larger systems too. Well, the, this is something I forgot to mention that uh, uh, we will have a significant improvement on the, on the energy consumption on the next generation. Okay, yeah, that'd be great to, yeah. Yeah, we're looking forward to experimenting with the next generation also. <laughs> now there's a benchmark suite and we can certainly uh, uh, more easily uh, do the experiments. Okay, I, I, I personally don't have anything else. Is there any other question from anyone on the call? It's been a long uh, meeting, almost three hours, but hopefully it was informative. Okay, well, if there's no question, then thank you, Fabrice and Remy, for uh, being guests here and contributing to the discussion. And thanks a lot, Juan, for the comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, the rigorous work. And for anyone else, uh, feel free to check out the paper and the benchmarks. And if you have any suggestions or improvements, you, you, we're, we're very much welcome. Uh, we very much welcome your feedback. So you can email Juan or myself related to that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. For your attention and for yeah. your contributions to the discussion. Amazing work. Amazing work, Ron and uh, Ono. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Remy. All right, good night. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.